Okay. And please uh, accept the rec this meeting is being recorded, so please go ahead with the continuing the recording. Okay. Good morning, Good morning uh, everyone. Good morning, uh, uh, dear Gustavo. Uh, I am very happy to be here, and I bring the greetings of the University of Rome uh, Tor Vergata for uh, uh, this uh, uh, very interesting international interdisciplinary symposium of global governance uh, that is now in its fourth edition. The first three uh, took place uh, in uh, our Villa Mondragone. Unfortunately, this year, due to the well-known um, problems uh, with this uh, pandemic event, uh, we have choose in our university uh, to be uh, very, uh, very strict uh, to uh, the, the, the pandemic condition, so we prefer uh, to uh, take the event uh, uh, online. Uh, Gustavo said to me that uh, approxim approximately uh, about uh, 200 first, second and third year students uh, of the three-year degree course in global governance uh, are present uh, and also some uh, of uh, previously uh, graduate uh, alumni. Uh, the global governance is a, a well-known course of our university and I would like to congratulate with Gustavo, the director of this course, for uh, uh, the success in the year of global governance and also for the uh, ever interesting and complete program that he prepared with the other uh, professor of global governance. First of all, I would like to congratulate with the third year class student, which is actually leaving. Almost all of them graduated a few days ago, and the rest of them in the month of September. They were very good, and almost all were accepted in many programs in Tor Vergata, in Italy, and also in a broad master's and master's degree. Uh, unfortunately, tomorrow I will not be there, but uh, I also really uh, wish for tomorrow graduation ceremony where the Togati will receive the parchment online in a formal ceremony. Uh, thanks uh, also to Tor Vergata teachers uh, and also to other teachers uh, of global governance for their involvement uh, in uh, this uh, course. Uh, I, would, I am sure of the success of uh, uh, this uh, interdisciplinary symposium uh, and also this year uh, I would like to uh, wish you a fruitful and good work. Best wishes to all of you and thanks again and good luck to all of you. And again, thank you, Gustavo, for your involvement for our university, which is really very appreciated by me and by all our community. Thanks again. Thank you so much, President. Thank you so much, Professor Schillacci. This was a wonderful introduction that I'm sure our, our students were really happy to hear. They are in an important moment of their life and your words were very, very important for, for all of them. Uh, I will now, if you don't mind, uh, Rector, proceed to introduce the event of uh, today by sharing just a few, just a few slides. Can you see the slides? Yes. Yes. Okay. Well, thank you again, uh, Professor Schilacci, for your, for your introduction of today. Let me immediately, usually we start at the end with the thank yous, but I think it's proper that we immediately start with the thank you for this special event, the fourth interdisciplinary global governance symposium. And my first thanks obviously goes to my university. Without Tor Vergata University, pushing forward, sustaining, investing in many, many activities, including the ones of global governance, including the ones of the symposium, nothing would have been possible. The many, many people in the, uh, in the 
university administration that have supported us over the years has gi have given an incredible contribution to the program and I thank them for that. I also wanted to thank immediately all the people that have worked very hard to make this event of today, the symposium, possible. I wish to thank profusely Patrizia for managing all the activities of today. I wish to thank Andrea, who will coordinate with us, Andrea Polloni, Patrizia Marta, Andrea Polloni, that will uh, uh, coordinate the event of today from the background, uh, from the behind the scenes, Antonino Zappulla, Giulia Mingoni, Valeria, Serena, who have given us big help to get us here. And obviously my big thanks goes also to the global governance community. Much of what you will be seeing today comes from the heart and the brain of our students and our faculty members. They have voted, as you well know, in the fall of 2019, before the COVID crisis, for us to discuss on the word community. They were, our students as usual, were in a sense far-sighted. Obviously the word community goes well beyond the issue of COVID, but it is a testimony of their sensitivities and their attention to global issues that they have chosen this word that we will all discuss today. But I also thanks all the colleagues that have discussed and debated in our boards, the Consiglio di Corso di Laurea, about this topic and how to find the proper guests for this, for this event. Obviously for us, this is the summit of the year of a program that is highly, highly interdisciplinary. Tor Vergata University has made an investment in internationalization, in interdisciplinarity, and we think that we have taken part of that mission in ourselves. We believe that interdisciplinarity is not necessarily the solution, but it is a great contribution to understanding what happens there in the world. And certainly it is not an easy thing, as this uh, quote by Roland Barthes obviously reminds us of. I want also to re formally uh, remember, remind everybody that global governance is the only Italian program, only Italian program, that belongs to the European Consortium of Liberal Arts and Science programs where disciplinarity of education and research is at the heart of their programs. So I wish to thank them too for, for this. Before leaving the floor immediately to, to, the, to those who will begin the first part of the event, let me very briefly say how this event is structured as tradition. This morning, we will have four distinguished guests that will come with their own personal perspective to talk to us about the word community. Let me briefly show you, and then uh, the coordinator of the event will introduce them more properly. Daniel Bell, political philosopher, from Tsinghua University and the School of Political Science at Shandong University, Marco Falcone, an infectiologist at the University of Pisa, Leo Penta, a reflective practitioner of community organizing at the German Institute for Community Organizing, DICO, and Jen Schradi, a digital quote-unquote sociologist at the Observatoire Sociologique du Changement at Sciences Po in Paris. They will discuss coordinated by our colleague, Professor Piero Vereni, an anthropologist, whom I'll leave you the floor very soon. The goal of the event, the desire of the event, that has always taken, in a sense, shape over the years, over the previous editions, is that by bringing each one its own perspective and then debating with the students in the final part of the morning, we will maybe be able to come out with a fifth definition of the word one that is understood in a sense and built by the debate by the debate itself. This is what we believe is a little sign of full interdisciplinarity. In the afternoon, we have an equally important moment. And uh, that it's a moment that has been built over the whole academic year by our students and by the teachers. They will confront the word community in the very many ways that uh, the word allows us to do 
with uh, medias, with speeches, with debates, with music, uh, with confrontation, with videos, they will be coordinated and they have been coordinated in this effort over the whole academic year by Professor Luca Pes of Venice International University, a consortium of universities all over the world, uh, which Tor Vergata has the honor to belong to. So without further ado, I'm just going to tell you four key words. Listen a lot, watch a lot, ask a lot, as is the tradition, as is customary in global governance. Professor Vereni already told you, you can use the chat room, but you can also use the blue button. And just uh, is, as, is, as is in the tradition of global governance, ask directly the question by putting the video on. Uh, and obviously, enjoy and enjoy this event at, as much as you can. Please keep during the whole event your videos on and your microphone off unless you are one of the speakers or one of the persons who wants to ask a question. So now I will stop the sharing and I will ask my colleague and I will leave the floor to my colleague and dear friend, Professor Piero Vereni. Piero, the event is yours. Thank you for doing this. Thank you, Gustavo. Thank you very much for allowing me to be to coordinate uh, this uh, uh, this uh, fantastic meeting. So I will immediately ask uh, uh, Daniel Bell to turn on uh, his video and begin sharing his PowerPoint. Uh, um, while I say just a few words that he is a political scientist and philosopher uh, who's been dealing with uh, notions of uh, democracy and hierarchy and uh, in his own career and he has been working in Asia for many years He's now uh, talking from from China uh, well he, he, he told us to uh, that it is afternoon for for him there so uh, Daniel the floor is yours and uh, I'm telling the students and all the attendees please if you have any questions you can of course you can participate to, to the discussion by rising, no, there's no way to raise your hand, but you can clap or you can, you can um, uh, like the, uh, some points of the, of the presentation. And if you have a special, uh, any question, either you can sum it up on the chat line, or you can just say that you want to intervene. So at the end of the, 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 the four presentations, I will begin to coordinate the different questions. Don't forget that this meeting is also organized for us to have the four lecturers to interact among themselves, okay? So we will have this double dimension. You know, one way the four lecturers will try to confront one another, and at the same time, the audience, the wider audience, will participate with the question. Uh, Daniel, please, you can start your presentation, and you have about 30 minutes, no, not about, you have precisely 30 minutes, uh, I will I will try to remind you if there are any any delays in, in your presentation, but please try to stick to, to, to the time. Otherwise, we're going to run out uh, of time. Thank you very much for for being with us, Daniel Bell. Hierarchical communities for the modern world: a progressive, conservative perspective. Uh, thank you so much for the kind invitation. I assume you can hear me. If not please let me know. Um, and good morning for you. I'm, I'm here in China where it's about 4.10 in the afternoon, but I'll try to imagine what it would mean to be live with everybody, and I hope we can meet uh, one day. Um, so my work, my talk here, it's actually the first time I'm doing this kind of talk. It combines two themes. My first book published about 25 years ago was on the idea of communitarianism. And this was a movement in political theory that criticized liberal individualism. And we tried to argue that there are some forms of community that are desirable for the modern world. And uh, in this book, there was a distinction between three forms of community. One is kind of intimate forms of community, like the family, based on face-to-face -face interaction. One called it community of memory, but basically it's community of strangers who share a common memory and sometimes common institutions. 
uh, could be religion, could be the nation state, could be a large political organization. Daniel, and the last one so, so I called it. May I ask you just because we, we see the PowerPoint, but we don't see yeah. it in, in presentation mode. You should have to click on uh, one of the icons down on the bottom line on the right. There should be an icon that says starts the presentation. Otherwise, we'll have uh, uh, a not clear view. Please, sorry for. Uh, is it better now? It is. Okay, thank you. Um, and the last form of community, I called it community of place. That's basically um, a community that has a physical location, like a, a village or a city, which is more common in the modern world. But my latest book, it's a defense of hierarchy. And I know in Italian, uh, it, uh, the word hierarchy is as pejorative, if not more so, uh, than in English. Um, but the basic assumption here in this book, let me go to the next slide, uh, one second. Um, uh, one second. Okay. Uh, oh, uh, the basic assumption uh, of this book, which was just published, is that any modern society needs hierarchies. And we know which ones are bad, hierarchies based on race or sex or caste, or sometimes people would say class. But there's very, in fact, there's no systematic work on what it means for a hierarchy to be desirable. So it seemed to be a good topic. And frankly speaking, much of it was inspired from living and working in China for so many years, because the idea of social hierarchy is taken for granted in China in everyday life. Um, and it makes sense to draw upon Chinese philosophy as well as history to think about which forms of social hierarchy are desirable in the modern world. But what we say in this book, it's co-written with a professor at uh, Fudan University in Shanghai called Wang Pei is meant to be um, relevant outside of China as well. So let me put these two themes together, really. And the idea here, the question is, which forms of hierarchical communities are desirable for the modern world? Um, and and, I, and so let me, let, let, that's what I'd like to discuss for this talk. I won't talk for a half an hour, I'll try to talk for less so as to leave more time for uh, discussion and questions. Now, again, the point is that any modern society, uh, complex, large scale, needs hierarchies. If, you, if, 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 if there's an attempt to abolish hierarchy, for example, the French Revolution or the Cultural Revolution in China, which was an attempt to uh, promote social hierarchy in all forms of life, uh, it didn't lead to equality, it led to chaos, and ultimately a great deal of violence. So it's important to think about which forms of hierarchy are bad so that we could minimize the influence of those unjust ones, like hierarchies based on race or sex. Um, but it's equally important to think about which hierarchies are good, and then to think about ways of promoting those forms of hierarchy. That's what we try to do uh, in this book. But let's move and relate it more directly to the theme of community, which is our topic for today. Now, you probably know uh, that in Chinese history and philosophy, the most important thinker was Confucius. And in the Anglophone world, people tend to think of Confucius as this very crusty, old, conservative, patriarchal uh, defender of a kind of old form of society. And it's certainly true that he was a traditionalist and that he was attached to tradition and that he believed that to have any decent society, you have to have some sort of strong attachment to traditional ways of life. Now, I don't think that's very, uh, actually many of us are traditionalists in this sense, but what's less well known is that he was also, a, what we would call today, a very progressive person. He was a very harsh critic of the status quo in his own day, and he wanted to uh, move towards 
a more politically and morally desirable society. And what exactly does this mean? What was his political ideal? Well, it was very much grounded in an ideal of community. And for him, the view, quite simply, is that the good life lies in rich and harmonious communal relations informed by a hierarchy. Now, the very important thing to note here is that he wasn't arguing in favor of one form of community which is supposed to determine and influence our whole ways of life. He said any decent society will have different forms of hierarchy, each of which is informed by tradition in a different way. So for example, the family is one intimate form of community that is informed by traditional values, um, but the political community is a very different form of community, also influenced by tradition, but will have, that has different ways of uh, moral justification. And he basically took hierarchy for granted, whether it's the family, whether it's politics, there has to be some form of social hierarchy. Now, we think, oh my God, he was writing 2000, well, he was actually, he wasn't writing, he was like Socrates who had ideas, but he didn't put them on paper. It was his students who put them on paper. Um, but he was writing around, well, he was thinking around the same time as Socrates, 2,500 years ago. And the question is, how can these ideas be updated for the modern world? And here in China now, there's a huge revival of tradition, including Confucianism. We know tons of things wrong with China, terrible abuses of human rights, constraints on freedom of speech. Those are all terrible things. But one good thing that's happening in China is that there's a revival of tradition, much of which has been uprooted for, the 20th, for much of the 20th century. But now people are thinking about reviving traditional ideas, not just Confucianism, but Taoism and Buddhism and other traditions and making them relevant for the modern world. So how can this Confucian idea of uh, different hierarchical forms of community be updated and made relevant for the modern world? Well, let's first talk about one form of hierarchy, the community, or one form of community, the community of intimates. Um, and the family, I think, whether it's China or Italy or Canada, where I'm from, many people think of a family as a very important source of the good life. And yes, it's grounded in tradition to a certain extent. But of course, it has to be updated. Um, now, you have a movement of social egalitarians who argue that the family should be a community of social equals, like friendship, right? I mean, friends in principle, they're supposed to treat each other as equals basically all the time. But it takes only a very you know, short moment to think of the family and realize that it's not typically based on equality. It's based on hierarchical relations. For example, the relation between parent and child is not a relation of equals. A parent has superior authority by virtue of their age and experience. Now, I don't think that's very controversial in the West. In China, there's also a hierarchy between adult children, let's say, who are 30 years old, and their parents, who might be 60 or 70 years old. And that idea is grounded in the value of filial piety, which is the reverence for the elderly, which is still so important in Chinese uh, everyday life as well as philosophy. I think it's relevant elsewhere too. And just to, I just want to say a few things in defense of this ideal. Um, again, it's a hierarchical relation, um, and it and it's meant to promote a form of community in the family. Now, why should the elderly have more authority simply based on their age? Well, actually, it's not simply based on their age. There are certain conditions. One condition is that, and here is a very Confucian ideal, throughout one's life, one has to be constantly committed to self-improvement. And there's an assumption that if you have more experience in different roles, as well as deeper experience in particular roles, we should improve morally. Now, if people stop being committed to self-improvement, or if they use violence to achieve their aims, then they sort of speak 
they lose what we can call the right to have superior authority based on their age. But if, as is not uncommon, people are constantly committed to improve themselves, then typically their uh, wisdom, we can use a modern word, would improve with age. And there's a lot of social science that supports this view that people usually grow wiser with age. Again, lots of counterexamples. We're talking about tendencies here, but social scientists have done a lot of research. It, again, it's summarized in our book, if, and it's an empirical point, but it supports this insight that typically speaking, as people grow older, they grow wiser. Now, why are these hierarchies justified? Well, let's think about it. The family-based hierarchies, the communities of intimates, what justifies those hierarchies is the, typically speaking, is the idea that roles change over time, right? The young become old, and eventually they will also exercise the superior authority that their parents had over them. So of course, and this is not something to celebrate, but sometimes the elderly lose cognitive and physical abilities and become young, almost like babies, who need to be cared for by their adult children. So the roles shift. And this is so important because we argue that any forms of hierarchy where the roles are ossified and meant to be permanent and impervious to change, those are morally justified. Whether it's, for example, racially based hierarchies, which cannot change, or hierarchies based on sex or gender. So that's why we, and here is a modern point, one that wasn't typically, uh, let's say, made explicit in the day of Confucius, but today we totally reject the view that men should have superior power over women because that's a fixed hierarchy. And typically the fixed hierarchies are oppressive. They benefit those with power and penalize those without power. So we reject the dominance of men over women. But if the communities of intimates, like the family, are characterized by shifting roles over time, then those communities can be morally justified. That's a point that we make in our book. But there are other forms of community. Um, well, before I go on to that, a little bit of background. And this is, again, it shows how progressive Confucius was in his own day. There's this Chinese word, junzi, and before Confucius' time, it was it meant to be like an aristocrat in the Western sense, someone who is old privilege due to their family background and blood. But Confucius says, no, a junzi is an exemplary person who has authority by virtue of their above average ability and especially their above average virtue. And it's no exaggeration to say that the next 2,500 years of Chinese history have been characterized by an argument about precisely how to, what it means to be a superior person with superior ability and virtue. Which abilities matter? Which virtues matter? How to assess abilities and virtues? So for example, the most famous way of assessing uh, uh, superior ability and virtue for public officials, and this is also uh, China's great contribution, political contribution to the rest of the world, if you want to regard as a contribution, is the examination system, which has a 1,300 year history in China. And the point of examinations was to select public officials with superior ability and virtue. And that idea has been re-institutionalized over the past four decades in China, where many public officials, in fact most, are selected first by examinations and then by performance evaluations at lower levels of government. Very similar to what you had in Imperial China. Of course, it's an ideal, and there's a huge gap between the ideal and the reality. For example, um, there, corruption is a huge problem in China. Um, but typically speaking, it's this ideal, we can call it political meritocracy. The idea that a political system should aim to select and promote public officials who have superior ability 
and virtue in the sense of a willingness to serve the political community. That's been so central to Chinese political culture. And we have to understand that idea to make sense of Chinese politics, to be frank. Now, let me use another example, which perhaps might be more familiar in Italy. And in a way, it's a very interesting comparison to be, it's not really meant to be provocative, it's really meant to be thought provoking. The Catholic Church is a kind of meritocracy in the same sense that the Chinese uh, Communist Party is meant to be a meritocracy. The Chinese Communist Party is composed of over 90 million members and a decades long process to move uh, in the hierarchy. And eventually, of course, after serving at lower levels of government and being promoted, they're meant when they're about 50 or 60, they're meant the, the winners, so to speak, achieve the highest levels of power. Now, uh, the Catholic, and what justifies the whole thing at the end of the day, though Communist Party uh, public officials are supposed to serve the well-being of members of the political community. Now, it's a very similar structure um, in, in form, again, in, in terms of the Catholic Church, which is also a community of strangers composed of much bigger, in this sense, 1.3 billion members. And what justifies the hierarchy, in a some sense, the same justification as for a large political organization like the Chinese Communist Party, they're meant to serve the well-being of members. Of course, again, like the Chinese Communist Party, there's a huge gap between the ideal and the practice, but very few people question the ideal itself. Hierarchy can and should be morally justified if it has the result in a community of strangers of serving the well-being of members of that political or religious community. So that's a second form of community. And the interesting part here is we have to be pluralistic here. What justifies a community of intimates, like the family, is different than what justifies a community or a community of strangers. A hierarchical community of intimates is justified if there are shifting roles between members of that community. A hierarchical community of strangers is justified if it has the effect of serving the well-being of those at the bottom of the hierarchy. It's a different structure of justification. There's another form of community, communities of place, physical communities, communities of, uh, and in the modern world, of course, in, uh, we also have villages and small towns in the modern world, but most people now live in cities, huge, large-scale cities, which inevitably are hierarchically organized. Now, some of them, of course, have a lot of room for democratic practices and equal participation, but some do not. Um, but I guess what I want to argue here is that hierarchy in large-scale communities of place is justified not necessarily because it's informed by a sense of community or equality, but rather first and foremost, because it contributes to a sense of belonging. Now, um, probably you know the most, are, well, I don't think it's an argument, it's, it's just an empirical fact that the most influential slogan of the modern world is, I love New York, right, with a heart. Um, the founder of that slogan actually just died recently, but it spread like wildfire where cities around the world use a similar slogan because it's so important for people to have a sense of community, a sense of love and belonging in their cities. Um, and we have an argument that it's much easier to justify love and belonging to a city than it is to a country because countries go to war. Uh, that's most important. But if you love a city, typically it doesn't necessarily lead to an antagonistic relationship with other cities, nor does it necessarily lead to a sense of, uh, let's say, hostility. In fact, usually it just means that I love my city has a, because I, I feel that I belong to it. And typically speaking, 
sense of belonging is just it comes from a sense that my city is special my community is special and different than other cities it has its own ethos its own character and where does that special ethos or character come from again this is an empirical point but i wrote a book called the spirit of cities with an israeli political theorist called avner de shalit and we argue that this sense of belonging this sense of uh, let's say special ethos or character from a city comes often from great city planners who use their power, yes, it's a hierarchy, to create a distinctive ethos that made citizens, that is those who inhabit citizens, proud of their city. And we use many examples in our book. Well, again, this book is called The Spirit of Cities. One is Baron Haussmann in Paris, who created a new distinctive ethos um, in the 19th century that made Paris what it is today. Um, in China, there are many examples that I can give you. If you're interested in Singapore, a great city planner was uh, Go King Sui, who, who used his brilliance uh, to li literally impose a kind of vision on the city, which was eventually endorsed by citizens and, and, and increased a sense of belonging. Um, or another example might be Bilboa in Spain, where basically um, it's one special museum um, designed by the Guggenheim Museum that was so beautiful that it led to the city having a special ethos based on uh, it being a center of an artistic uh, community. So the basic point here is that we don't have to worry about cities being based on a center on equal, equality or social equality. In fact, in any large scale community, it's impossible to have higher, higher social equality um, at all levels of social interaction. In fact, sometimes hierarchy can be justified if it leads to a sense of uh, the city being special and creating a sense of belonging and love among its citizens. So the, again, the interesting part here overall that what makes a community, uh, what makes a hierarchical community morally justified depends on the form of community. For a small scale community of intimates, what's so important is to have shifting roles. For a community of strangers, based on memory and shared institutions, in a way it exists first and foremost in people's minds, doesn't necessarily have a physical location. The most important thing is the hierarchy serves the interests of those who are members of that uh, community, especially those who have less power. And for communities of place, the most important justification for a hierarchy is that it leads to a sense of belonging. And that really comes from the city being viewed as special. And if great city planners can contribute to that sense of distinctiveness, then those great city planners should be celebrated. And we don't have to worry so much about whether this city is characterized by more or less social equality. Now, again, I'm a progressive, meaning that I'm against racism, against sexism, against caste society. Totally, I don't like uh, uh, class-based hierarchies. Um, but I'm also a traditionalist in the sense that Confucius value tradition. And I think many people outside of China share this, these seemingly conflicting attachments to both tradition and community, uh, oh, sorry, to both tradition and progressive values. And we can be committed to both tradition and progressive values and make sense of which communities, especially which hierarchical forms of community are justified. We have to allow for pluralism and allow for different justifications for different forms of our whole community. So that's where I'll end here, and I more than welcome comments as well as criticisms. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Daniel, for this uh, brilliant presentation. It was really extremely interesting to hear uh, this analysis of the, the notion of a hierarchy that is uh, typically almost tabooed in, 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 in Europe, I suppose. Uh, and the way you have described it has really uh, raised ma many interesting points. We have already a few questions. 
but I think uh, we could go uh, on and collect those questions for the end of the four presentations. If you, if you, if it is okay for you, uh, Tamoy. Okay. Okay. So if you can stay uh, with us, or maybe okay. I think we have four minutes left, so we can maybe we can ask now Tamoy to turn on his uh, his video and and the audio and uh, and put the question, and then uh, we will see how to go on with the second presentation. Tamo, are you there? We cannot really hear you. Um, yes, can you see me? Yes, of course. Ciao, Hello Tamoy. there. Uh, just woke up. I'm so sorry. I wasn't expecting <laughs> to be given the, the floor. But oh. Professor Bell, that was a very interesting uh, <clears throat> viewpoint, actually. But uh, I was, I'm very motivated myself by value of cosmopolitanism, but still, um, yeah, critical of like this communitarian Confucian values of hierarchy and loyalty because I know what that means in terms of social rigidity in modern China, uh, at least, and in other Confucian countries like Korea and Japan. And I think that ultimately individuals lose in this communitarian ideals. Uh, do, Professor, don't you think that some of the stuff that you discussed actually are against values of human rights, values of individual liberty and freedom that we have growing up in the West? Um, well, thank you. That's a great question. Um, and I agree that in practice, these ideals are often distorted and often lead to uh, violations of human rights and violations of uh, or severe restrictions on individual freedom. Um, but if we also agree that we cannot have any modern society without forms of hierarchical community, then we need to think about specifying which forms of hierarchical community are bad and why, and also which forms of hierarchical community are good, and then promote the good ones and, min and minimize the bad ones. I mean, we can't, unless you think that we can have a modern world without any forms of hierarchy or any forms of community, which I think is a very, to be frank, not just unrealistic, but also dangerous idea, um, then I, I think then we, 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 we need to, and so much has been written about the bad forms of, uh, let's say, let's call them hierarchical communities. Um, and, and I agree, that needs to be done. We need to criticize that. I mean, there's terrible violations of human rights and individual freedom. Um, but we also need to think about, and here again, uh, about which forms of hierarchical community are morally defensible. And we can't just, you know, we can't just assume that that's not a relevant question. Um, if we don't make this distinction between good and bad forms of hierarchical community, I think then we lose a lot. And it, and it makes us, well, we need to think clearly about which forms are bad, which forms are good, in order to move to, a, a, I guess, a better world. I guess that's my assumption. Okay, okay. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, we are perfectly in time. We have more questions uh, um, for, for Daniel Bell, but uh, we need to go on. Uh, we can pick up, collect those questions at the end of the presentation. Okay, so to see also how they can interact with, uh, with, other, um, with uh, the other presentation. Now uh, it is the floor is open for uh, Dr. Marco Falcone. Uh, the, the timely of our invitation is uh, 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 exemplified by the fact that three weeks ago, uh, Dr. Marco Falcone has been uh, elected uh, head of the European Study Group on Infections on the Elderly of the European Society of Clinical Microbiology and Infectious Diseases. Of course, uh, the, the key word, along with community, in his case, is infection. Um, Dr. Marco Facone, the floor is yours. Uh, 
turn on the, the, the screen. I don't really see you yet. And if you have a PowerPoint presentation, you can start sharing the screen. Uh, again, you have uh, a 30, min 30 minutes maximum for your presentation. Okay, I'm trying to... Okay, first I... Okay, is yes. uh, my presentation is going? Perfect. Yes, Go. thank you. First, uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much for the invitation. I'm really grateful to uh, Professor Piga and to you and to all the staff that organized this really exciting meeting. I think that uh, interdisciplinary meetings are the most uh, interesting, uh, is that one of the most interesting way. Is there any microphone open, I think? And uh, is the most interesting way to discuss some new, some, some new pers from a new perspective, some problems on some uh, words of, um, of with uh, an actual interest. My perspective is from an infectious disease uh, physician. I'm a medical doctor and I work, uh, uh, my clinical activity, also my research activity is uh, focused on uh, uh, nosocomial infection, community acquired infection, and then I will discuss you about the, the term community from my perspective. I think that uh, we will discuss some, uh, some uh, uh, peculiar features of this uh, world. I start my presentation with a slide that uh, was presented me, not the same, it's not exactly the same, but it's quite similar from my professor of pathological anatomy. It's one of the most difficult exams during the, the medicine um, study. And um, I, my professor spoke me about pneumonia, classifying this infection, in from an anatomopathological point of view. But when the lung is infected, I really simplify the, the, the uh, situation. There is a first phase in where there is a congestion of the lung. A lot of, of blood is uh, uh, come into the lung. And this phase is called red hepatization. These are some, uh, um, some aspects of the lung that were quite common in the pre-antibiotic era when the patient died for pneumonia without the possibility to use antibiotics. And this then, nowadays, is really uncommon to see these pathological features, but this is a classification. Then after the infection go uh, forward, you have a gray hepatization on the right. You see the gray hepatization. That is a, a more advanced phase in which there is a um, a, a fibrosis evolution of the infection and the final phase is all the resolution or the death in some cases. Well, this was a classification that is uh, from a pathology, anatomopathological point of view valid. But when I did the exam of internal medicine, internal medicine is uh, one of the, uh, the clinical, clinical exams, my professor of internal medicine classified pneumonia in a different way. And uh, he spoke, of, uh, he divided pneumonia in lobar or interstitial or also typical or atypical pneumonia. Typical pneumonia, so-called typical pneumonia, is a pneumonia that uh, interest, it involves one specific area of the lung, you go on the left, while interstitial or atypical pneumonia is a pneumonia that involves both lungs with a, a distribution in almost all, all pulmonary areas. And this is really important, this classification, because the bacteria that cause typical pneumonia are usually different from bacteria or viruses that cause atypical pneumonia. And you can classify this pneumonia according to this classification, you can predict which is the etiology of pneumonia and to start an antibiotic therapy 
that is more appropriate in one case or another case. But uh, you can also classify pneumonia according to the severity. This is the prognostic classification of pneumonia. For example, severe pneumonia, pneumatic oxygen support, or non-severe pneumonia, there are several features that can be useful to classify these two uh, types of pneumonia. Severe pneumonia typically is the pneumonia that we observe it during the COVID-19 pandemic, or non-severe pneumonia is the pneumonia that usually doesn't need the hospitalization. Well, why I started with this introduction? Because nowadays the classification of pneumonia that is accepted for clinical studies and that is uh, used also in uh, all the uh, scientific community is the, the epidemiological classification and it distinguishes between community acquired and notifications of pneumonia, but we use this classification, community versus non-community. And the question is, is this classification better than the previous ones, or why we use this classification? This classification is proposed by FDA, by several uh, institutions, and nowadays is accepted. The, the, the reason because we use this classification is based on uh, the fact that patients that live in the community usually have pneumonia caused by microbes that are different to those that cause pneumonia that is acquired in the hospital. If you live in the community, usually you have a pneumonia caused by bugs, microorganisms that are usually susceptible to antibiotics. While if you are hospitalized after the third day of hospitalization, you have a risk of pneumonia caused by nosocomial microorganisms that are usually resistant to antibiotics. And this is the way and the reason because we use this classification. This classification is based on uh, several studies that have focused their attention on the etiology of pneumonia, which are the cause of pneumonia. We, the problem in pneumonia, and this is the reason because this classification, community acquired pneumonia, is the most used, is the accepted, is because we are not able with the usual standard practice in medicine to identify the cause of pneumonia, the microbial, the microbial etiology of pneumonia in all cases. We are able to identify the microbial etiology in 30, 40% of cases. Because if you arrive to the general practitioner or to the emergency department with pneumonia, and you are not so severe that you need an invasive ventilation and intubation, there are not so much tests that are useful to, de to detect etiology. This is a problem for pneumonia because ideally, you have to do a bronchoscopy that is a very invasive exam in, in which a tube is introduced in the trachea and arrives into the, the lungs and aspire, there is an aspiration of some liquid and you do the exam to a certain etiology. But all the other tests, there are some tests, are not useful to a certain the etiology in all cases. Then you have to apply a probabilistic, probabilistic approach you know that in community acquired pneumonia, usually pathogens are streptococcus pneumonia is the typical agent of pneumonia, and the other ones, why in hospital acquired pneumonia, you have different microorganisms, more aggressive, and that are usually resistant to antibiotics. Then this classification based on the, um, on the, um, the, the site in when a patient lies, lives is useful to start an empirical therapy. I'm not sure of the epidemiology uh, of the etiology and I apply a probabilistic, um, a probabilistic, uh, um, uh, probabilistic approach to start an empirical therapy that is probably, probably appropriate to treat patients with community acquired pneumonia or patients with hospital acquired pneumonia. Then this classification, simply help clinicians in choosing empiric antibiotic therapy. But usually I'm not sure that this empiric antibiotic therapy 
is effective against the cause the microorganisms that cause pneumonia, which is the problem of this classification and how we can we can accept this classification in all the cases, or we have some problems with this classification. The problem of this classification, as all binary classifications, is that uh, you refer to a duality, community or hospital, and then you have to do to have two opposite parts and um, metaphorically is, is like uh, two sides of a coin and that there is duality. Well, in medicine and in general, in the biological phenomena, it's really, really impossible to have two, a, a fixed, a, so, um, a classification that distinguish A or B, black or white, in a so precise term. It's not really, really, it's not possible in the, in the, in the reality. This is a classification that helps clinicians to be appropriate in the majority of cases, in a good proportion of cases, but you cannot consider a classification of the biological phenomena in all cases. And um, one, uh, there, is a, there is a phrase that can, uh, that can uh, explain which is the potential problem with this classification. Uh, if the rooster crows at the break of dawn, then the rooster causes the sun to rise. This is not a causation relationship. This is an association. It is an association with, uh, between the sun to rise and the rooster crows at the break of dawn, but there is no causation. And uh, probably in, uh, in this classification of community acquired pneumonia versus hospital acquired pneumonia, we are looking to, a, we, we are using an association of some etiology, but there is not a direct relationship. We are not sure that bacteria that cause community acquired pneumonia cause a community acquired an infection in all cases. This is, for example, in a, a, a case is, uh, an uh, old article published in uh, 2005. I work at the Rome in Sapienza, USA, your Rome. We, uh, at the time, we uh, described the first case in Italy of a pneumonia in a 37 year old patient without any underlying disease, any comorbidities, any medical history that developed a pneumonia caused by Staphylococcus aureus medicinal resistant. This is a species of Staphylococcus aureus that is resistant to all the beta-lactam, all penicillins, all the antibiotics that are usually used in the clinical practice in the community. Okay, the patient at the emergency department started Keftriaxone, that is a beta-lactam, plus claritromycin, a macrolide. This is the typical therapy that we use in community acquired pneumonia, but the therapy failed and the patient had septic shock and I finally survived, but it was a really difficult clinical course. And uh, for example, this was a community acquired pneumonia, but the etiology was not the etiology that I, um, that this declassification considered probable. Probability was not uh, the, um, in this case, for example, the classification of community acquired pneumonia was not useful to classify this case. And we failed the initial therapy and we adjusted the therapy after 20, 40, of 48 uh, hours, and when you start an, an antibiotic therapy, that uh, the, an effect antibiotic therapy, not at the start of infection, but later, there is the risk to be inappropriate, and the patient has an greater risk to die. For this, has been in, introduced a new, a new class of pneumonia has been proposed. Considering epidemiological classification, some authors proposed this definition, healthcare-associated pneumonia. Healthcare-associated pneumonia refers to patients who live in the community, okay? But there are some risk factors for an infection by a resistant microorganism. For example, those who are in hemodialysis, patients in hemodialysis three times a week have, have to go to the hospital. Patients who receive wound care, chronic wound care. Patients who stay in long-term care facilities or nursing homes, or patients who has been discharged during the previous three months from the hospital. The problem is that if a patient goes 
to the hospital, there is a risk of colonization by multidrug resistant microorganisms that are typical of the hospital. And when it develops an infection in the community, the etiology, the cause of infection is a multidrug resistant microorganism. And then we have introduced a new, a new, um, a new actor in this theater, not just community acquired pneumonia or hospital acquired pneumonia, but community acquired pneumonia, healthcare associated pneumonia, and hospital acquired pneumonia. Well, also this classification is uh, useful to detect all cases. We found, we did a study, this study that was performed with the uh, help of uh, uh, Alessio Farcomeni, that is uh, a statistician that works in Torregada uh, University, that, that uh, is uh, uh, our, is, uh, uh, that I collaborate with him also now that I work in this a really, really uh, good statistician. And uh, we tried to evaluate if an etiology by multidrug resistant microorganism is related to this definition, healthcare associated pneumonia. And these are all patients with a pneumonia by a resistant microorganism. And as you see, one third of these cases were classified as community acquired pneumonia, not just as healthcare associated pneumonia. And what it means that also healthcare associated pneumonia, also trying to identify an intermediate class that is different from community acquired pneumonia and hospital acquired pneumonia is not sufficient to identify, to stratify all the patients who have an infection by a multidrug resistant microorganism. These are attempts that demonstrate how it's difficult to stratify just with some risk factors, just with using some epidemiological factor, how it's difficult to stratify patients with high level of complexity. And what we have to do? We have to do toward a precision medicine. All this approach that I show you is the usual approach that we, is the approach that we use in the clinical practice in all the hospitals over the world, because these are, these are the instruments that we have. But we are developing new strategies to improve the possibility to screen it to be appropriate in a better way. Which is, what is precision medicine? This is on the left, we have the classical approach. For example, this is applied to bacterial infection or to infection. I have a patient, I start according to some risk factors and empiric therapy. I'm not sure that this therapy is valid, but I take in consideration some factors, epidemiological factors that are useful to be more appropriate as I, as I can. But uh, this empiric therapy, which is the implication that I have to use broad spectrum antibiotics, I have to, to use more antibiotics, no, not just one antibiotic, but more antibiotics that cover different pathogens. I have an increase in the antibiotic consumption. This promotes resistance development because the resistance is directly related to the use of antibiotics and then more resistant pathogens and so for more potent agents and the disease a vicious cycles that increase the antimicrobial resistance. You can say that antimicrobial resistance in some, uh, some, uh, some authors consider case in the world will be antimicrobial resistant because a lot of patients with uh, several um, pathologies that uh, nowadays we are going to cure in a better way will be exposed to infection by multidrug resistant pathogens. Precision medicine, you have to choose a targeted therapy. I have to be sure what I'm treating and how can I do? I have to use a companion diagnostic test. This is a community of patients. I use a companion diagnostic test, which is companion diagnostic is, for example, a medical device which provides information that is essential for the safe and effective use of a corresponding drug. I have to use a drug when I'm sure what I'm using for. And then I have to have instruments that improve my possibility to recognize in a very, very precise way which is the cause, the etiology, which is the 
um, the situation that, that I'm treating. For example, if I use, if I apply this to community acquired pneumonia, with the classical approach, I, did, I have to use broad spectrum agent and with companion narrow spectrum agent. I use an antibiotic, single antibiotic that is effective against the, the pathogen that cause community acquired pneumonia. I give you some examples. For example, this is a paper that's been just released two, two weeks ago, in which some authors evaluated more than 5,000 patients with COVID-19 pneumonia, and they evaluated all the profiles at uh, computer tomography of the chest, and they elaborated the software possibility to identify according to the CT, to the computer tomography um, uh, aspects, according to the computer tomography findings, can predict with uh, uh, the etiology by COVID-19 patients. For example, you see in these cases, you can distinguish between community acquired pneumonia caused by bacterial etiology and COVID-19 patients that uh, have uh, um, pneumonia caused by SARS-CoV-2. Okay, this is really interesting as you see, but uh, what is uh, introduced more than the usual diagnostic? In my opinion, you are looking for a probabilistic approach that is more, more, more advanced probabilistic approach, but in this case too, you don't have the certain, you, 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 are, no, you are not uh, uh, culturing the virus. This is a probabilistic approach, more advanced, more sophisticated, that allow you to be more sure that this pneumonia is caused by virus, for example, COVID-19 or bacteria. But we have future possibility that technology has did great advancement during the last years. We can do, for example, we, we go to the samples of respiratory tract of a patient with pneumonia. You can take this uh, sample, for example, sputum of a patient that has pneumonia, and with this machine, machine remove all the human DNA and analyze all just bacterial DNA. And according to some sequences, in one hour, you have the result of this test. And this can say you a response, for example, E. coli with 100% identity. This is molecular biology that help clinician in the diagnosis of lower respiratory infection. This is a great advancement, and I, I want to explain you which is the, the role of these techniques. For example, this is the first paper that uh, uh, described in nature, this was 26th of January, the virus causing COVID-19, the virus, but the Chinese investigator with the use of molecular biology, evaluated the sequences of the virus that was originated during this outbreak of pneumonia in Wuhan. And according to the, to the uh, genome uh, evaluation, they defined the type of virus and the homology. This is a phylogenetic tree, the homology with other virus of animal origin, probable bat origin. What I want to give you as message from this example, that uh, in 2003, with the SARS virus, with the SARS virus, the, from the start of the epidemic and to the discovery of the virus, there were three months. After three months from the start of the epidemic, the investigators, the scientists, were able to identify exactly the uh, sequences of the genome of the virus. With SARS-CoV-2 and COVID-19, we were able to publish on the clinical literature, literature uh, of the world, the scientific literature, the genome of the virus after one week from the isolation of, of, and the diagnosis of the first patient. And then we have to understand how these new techniques are useful to contain and to investigate all the new public health problems because uh, with the aid of these new techniques we are able to do something that during the uh, one decade the uh, one decade ago was not simply possible 
and that the evolution is so fast that if within few years you will be able to to do more and more than what we are doing now okay anyway my final message these are last two slides they refer to a concept we have seen that uh, we apply a probabilistic effect and this is uh, not valid in all in all the cases is and there is some an area of uh, um, um, the, the, there is a gray area in which you are not sure what you are treating for i gave you some examples of the new techniques by molecular biology um, other techniques that are useful artificial intelligence really learning machine and then we are trying to investigate biological phenomena in the better way anyway biological phenomena are difficult to be um, to be so classified in a rigid way you have to consider that the man the patient is a complexity there is a real a high level of complexity of diversity probably you have to uh, apply an individual approach this individual approach is based on the techniques and to be to um, to go to the unity a un, unique vision for unique vision you have to consider that uh, there is a human factor that is pretty important and this is the the way in which you are able to do the medical doctor medical doctor should use all the information that comes from technology from statistics from epidemiology but should be able each patient is different from the other one and to unify his vision in a single in a single way and the single way is the patient my last slide is a, a phrase of william osler that was a clinician that lived at the end of 18 that uh, said it is much more important to know what sort of a patient has a disease than what sort of a disease a patient has. And I thank you very much for your attention. Oh, okay. Thank you very much. Um, Marco, it was an incredibly interesting um, presentation. Uh, we, we learned exactly that uh, apparently every man is an island <laughs> uh, because we, we normally we would think that uh, that there are, I mean, uh, shared patterns, and of course, but in order to to realize this precision, to make uh, this precision medicine uh, a standard, we have to focus on on the way that the single individual, the person, is uh, is uh, specified by its own uh, characteristics. Um, we have uh, we don't really have time for for questions only. And I, I don't see hands up yet. I have checked. Uh, so I will keep. We will keep uh, the questions for for the, the second part. Please, there are already people booked for for uh, the discussion session. And I think it's time to leave now the floor um, to our third speaker, uh, which is Leo Penta. Uh, uh, Leo is uh, is uh, one of the creator let's say of the community organizing model he's been working on this on this uh, system of creating uh, community based organizations um, since uh, since since many decades and uh, he he is now uh, he is now a funding directing of the german institute for community organizing the ico I leave the floor to uh, to Professor Leo uh, Joseph Bent. Can can you? Are you hearing me? Now, now we can see. Yeah. If you have a PowerPoint, you can share it now. Will you please? Yes, that's that's what I'll do right now. Oh, perfect. Okay, and I can, no. All right, thank you very much for the invitation. And can, can you start uh, the, the sh if you see the bottom line on the right, there are four icons. Yeah. You have to click on the last one, that's one, perfect. But, okay, now we go. We can't hear you anymore. 
No, no. Okay, okay. Go. Uh, yeah, I'd like to uh, talk today about the notion of political community, and I call the paper from a community of faith to what I'd like to term enabling community. And um, I'm going to do so by considering political community in terms of its intentional practices. In other words, in terms of habitual ways of behaving in the world, you could even say in terms of its virtues. And in doing so, I will implicitly at least distinguish political community on the one hand from what you might want to call politics as usual, that is politics as forms of government, elective offices, administration, and on the other hand, also from economic forms of activity, from the activities of market systems. And so looking at political community in terms of its intentional habits is important, I think, uh, because there is always the temptation, it's an age-old temptation, probably goes back to Plato, to turn the human birthright of politicalness, as someone like Sheldon Wolin has termed it, into something technical, into merely a set of methods and tools and procedures. In other words, to turn questions of practical judgment into technocratic models. Instead, I'd like to look at it in terms of consistent practices, and particularly in terms of four practices that I would uh, like to uh, talk about today. And you can see that in the, the overview in just that I'm in this next slide. But before I do so, I think it's important to mention the central presupposition that informs uh, my treatment of this topic today, because I approach it from the standpoint and experience of my 40 years of community organizing. Uh, I'm in the first place a practitioner, and my practice has been in the practice of broad-based community organizing uh, for a while in North America, in New York and Philadelphia, from where I come from, but also in uh, the last 20 years uh, in Europe, particularly in Germany. So what exactly does, uh, does this mean? to say that I'm a community organizer. And I'd like to borrow the words of Mike Eakin, who is a mentor, a friend, and uh, the former director of the Industrial Areas Foundation, that is the largest community organizing network in the United States. And I'm first gonna tell you what I am not. I'm not a consultant or a facilitator or an advisor, I'm not a service provider, a, a do-gooder maybe, not an ideologue, not a political operative, not a pundit, not a progressive in many ways, uh, and not an activist. So who am I? Who are we as organizers, as community organizers? I think first of all, we're people who understand human beings as political animals and who are comfortable with the words, with words like leader, power, action, confrontation, negotiation, relationships organizations. And we are people who, perhaps as Hannah Arendt might put it, try to figure out how to make initiatory collective action in the public arena, in the public square, if you will, not just the exception and not just limited to symbolic action and protest. And also not something done largely by professionals and done usually alone, professionals called politicians or influencers or elites. And so we are people who wrestle day in and day out with the challenge of building and nurturing a collective we, a collective we of action, if you will, in a world of me. Taking place whether in East Brooklyn, New York, where I began in a neighborhood or a part of a city like Neukölln in Berlin, a section of um, Turin, Barriere di Milano, or right here in Tor Vagata in Rome. And so I'd like to give a shout out to a couple of my colleagues who are here, Diego Galli, um, Sara Fanolio, who are doing similar work in those places. And the question that drives us is really, how can you bring diverse people together in and through the groups they belong to, the institutions they belong to, so that they act collectively in the public arena for the common good and do that over the long term. That's what drives us, that's what pushes us, that's what compels us. 
And I'd like to then return to the consideration of political community as uh, distinct from what we might call, and I'm using a phrase from Luke Bretherton here, here, a community of fate. Simply the fact that we are thrown together, whether we like it or not, particularly in cities, with all kinds of people who are different than we are. Yet at the same time, we are in some way dependent upon them because we share the same fate as they do. If, for example, as Bretherton says, the electricity goes off or if uh, the gangs rule the streets, we are all affected. And in these pandemic times, we could say even more so, this is almost universally applicable, uh, we all face together, no matter where we live, the common threat of the COVID virus as a community of fate, if you will, at this time. And against this backdrop, the question of political community can then be seen as the question of how do we move from this uh, haphazard, passive, we could even say coercive form of community of faith to one that is intentional, one that is life enhancing within the societal context of diversity and difference. And I'd like to um, try to answer that question by looking at four key habits through which political community is constituted. And the first of these is the habitual practice, and I will then go into them a little bit more afterwards. Uh, the habitual practice of relating. And by that I mean, if you will, meeting people instead of simply attending meetings. The habitual practice of collective action as something different from uh, labor, from making, from uh, other ways of being in the world, if you will. Thirdly, the habitual practice of understanding and analyzing power that comes along whenever we begin to try to relate or act. And the habitual practice then also of systematic reflection upon uh, action that we do as an intentional community or as an intentional political community. And so I'd like to put that in the context to begin with the first one of uh, the habit of relating to recall uh, an interesting uh, aspect of this brought in by Sheldon Wolin in his work. The problem of the political is not to clear a space from which society is kept out, but rather to ground power in commonality while reverencing diversity and not simply respecting difference. And I think the way to reverence diversity um, is, in fact, um, the key to developing, or is, in fact, the, um, the question for us of how to develop face-to-face -face relationships with others, and especially to do that with people who are other than I am, who are foreign, who are different, however we may describe that different from those I've been taught to expect, even conditioned to um, keep at arm's length. And of course, our own perceptions of the foreign or the different or the other uh, are conditioned by the way in which um, we, our, our social uh, reality has been structured in the way that we've been brought up, in the place that we've been brought up, in the uh, ways that we've been educated, and so forth. And what may be sameness for one is a world of difference, of course, for someone else. And this is where reverencing diversity begins, from all sides of the diversity question, not only from the majority culture to the minority culture, if you will. So I'd like to overcome this sense of, um, of identity politics, if you will, uh, in this way. Because concretely, this habit entails going out toward people wherever we find them in their institutions and associations of public life, not waiting for people to come to us, which is usually the way much of what work in the social realm is perceived as. Uh, very concretely, you could say this means less uh, flyers, advertisements, Facebook posts, and Instagram messages, and more face-to-face -face con conversations. 
particularly difficult, of course, at this time, but that's, that's an issue that we can, uh, we can talk about how perhaps to overcome some of that, even in times of COVID. But doing hundreds of these conversations, in fact, with people who are very different from each and every one of us. And doing them not so much about trying to poll people about their fact, about facts or their opinions, but trying to get to what moves people, what their interests are, what makes them tick, if you will, in their public lives, and not what I assume makes them tick, or not what I think they ought to be interested in, but actually to find out what moves them, what they are interested in. What are their stories that lead them to do what they do and to be who they are? Of course, to do this, I have to be willing to share my own story in order to hear their stories, the stories about what give them energy, what make them angry, perhaps, what is their focus, what vision they have for themselves and for society, for their family, their neighborhood, and to do this, as I say, across a lot of boundaries. And so at its core, this first habit is a habit of reweaving the fabric of social society through shared stories that articulate actual interests instead of prejudices and stereotypes. But to do that or in doing that and having done that or in the process of doing that, it's not an end in itself. It's not just an exercise in group formation and collective conversation, but it forms the basis for persistent initiatory action, action together, around issues that people themselves have come up with, issues that in general also tend to hold decision makers accountable, to push for positive change and to create new multi-sector partnerships. Um, and so this community of fate as it acts uh, purposely to, purposefully together becomes, if you will, in this, in this action together, a political community prior to any party politics, and I would say beyond identity politics. So that uh, recognition and respect is not given simply by dint of having a different culture or a different identity, but rather it's conditional on one's contribution to and participation in a shared and reciprocal public work as uh, Luke Bretherton has termed it. And it means taking the initiative. It means acting preemptively and not merely reacting to crises. And ideally, as I say, it means then sharing responsibility for the common good along with uh, those other um, places of responsibility and uh, also shaping of the public realm, whether they be public officials, administrators, corporate officials, to create and be co-creators of the society in which we live. In other words, being in some sense also the basis for a democratic polity, a democratic polity that begins not with uh, forms of government and public officials or with systems of the market, but with uh, original political community. But accountability also means there can and will be conflict, confrontation of a nonviolent kind, but it also means that conflicts arise around issues that are less ideological and based more on shared self-interest in finding solutions together. And that can only happen when legitimate interests on both sides are clearly stated and pursued in the context of the organized community. And then they are conflicts amenable to negotiation and compromise. But that can only happen if, as I say, this original political community, if, it, if you will, does its own homework and gets itself together through relationship and then has the ability to act and the ability to act over the long term. But this insight leads to a third, and that is um, the habit of understanding and analyzing power. Whenever we act together, we become aware of the power dynamics present in all human relationships, and particularly in public relationships. To deny this or attempt to overcome this basic human reality in utopian forms of public life leads to disaster. 
Instead, power must be understood and power relationships clarified so that collective action can be clearly focused and effective. In this way, power can be held mutually accountable and placed in the service of human flourishing. And I will say next is admittedly, admittedly drastically oversimplified, but can nonetheless provide a few guideposts for understanding power in the realm of political community. We can consider power as having two basic sources, organized people and organized money. And it can usually be found in some combination of these two. While other sectors of human society become increasingly commodified, intentional political community relies most on organized people, although it cannot neglect the need for basic monetary resources. Furthermore, power can be classified, I think, in two forms. Again, oversimplifying, but in the form of unilateral power, power over, and in the form of relational power or power with others. Political community constituted in relationship and action can generate power with, can generate the power of people acting together relationally and thus break open the zero sum assumptions of unilateral power, of dominational power. And in action, relational power is actualized. And I think here, just want to take a reference to Hannah Arendt, um, the actualization of power is key to the preservation of political community. And this cannot be compensated for in any way, uh, simply by material riches, by wealth, by the power of the market, by, if you will, ultimate commodification. And this is actualized, she says, where word and deed have not parted company, where words are not empty, deeds are not brutal, where words are not used to veil intentions, but to disclose realities and deeds are not used to violate and destroy, but to establish relations and create new realities. From there, I'd like to move to the fourth and final uh, habit, briefly at least, the habit of reflection. This is exemplified, first of all, at least in the community organizing context, but I think in many others, in the practice of evaluation, especially with reference to action that has been uh, done together. It is the space where people can also think together from a bit of a distance to reconsider together what they have done together. In community organizing, this is done, first of all, immediately after every action with the key participants, and often then at a further temporal distance with a wider circle of leaders. And since action is effective primarily in the reaction, evaluation usually focuses on the reaction and the reaction of various participants, but also the reaction of others over and against whom the action uh, takes place. And the roles of those acting together, their feelings, their learning experience uh, are things to be considered. And usually next steps are formulated so that a single action leads to the planning of further action and generally to action campaigns. This is further internalized usually and or can be and my opinion should be that moves beyond just the tactical and strategic to contextualize action in a wider framework of thought. To the extent that people are engaged in the habits of intentional political community, their hunger for a deeper understanding of the human condition of the condition of politicalness, if you will, grows. And so I'd like to take these um, four together. And uh, we know that to varying degrees, they are found in many activities with which we are familiar. Although I think that in the landscape of civil society, they are unfortunately too rarely found in conjunction with one another. Yet the kind of political community that can emerge from these four consistent practices, I would like to call enabling community. And the formulation is purposely ambiguous. Um, yet I think this ambiguity serves a purpose. 
and it sets out an aspirational horizon for a political community as culture, as culture, in fact, as a counterculture, if you will. On the one hand, community, so far it is realized, brings beneficial effects, both for individuals and for our life together. Few would argue with this. But community, especially political community, always simultaneously needs to be enabled, to be built, to be rebuilt, to be disorganized and reorganized. It is a work in progress. It is a process of ongoing negotiation, confrontation, conciliation, and compromise. It is the risk and also the reward of a public life shared with others. And I'd like then to simply close with a quote from Sheldon Wolin once again, that the nature of the political is that it requires renewal. It is renewed not by unique deeds whose excellence sets some beings apart from others, but by rediscovering the common being of human beings. The political is based on this possibility of commonality, our common capacity to share, to share memories and a common fate. And I guess just like to throw out the question, uh, in a sense, who is ready for the work of, re, of organizing and reorganizing enabling community in our time and place today. Thank you very much. And oh, thank uh, happy to take your questions either now or later, depending on the time. Thank you very much, Lee. It's been really a fascinating presentation. And, uh, and uh, I, I don't see yet um, uh, people looking for the questions, but uh, of course it is, we, we have uh, maybe two or three minutes, just, just a quick, Quick remark. Uh, it, it is a sort of a question that I wanted also to ask to Marco Falcone, and I will maybe repeat it later. But w what is the, the, the practical feasibility uh, of this module in, in, in terms of realizing it? You know, Tobacada is involved in, in, in a process of community building in the, in the complex neighborhood of, of uh, Torbella Monaca, which is on the other side uh, of the main uh, road via Casalina. From, from our university. And we, we find sometimes difficult exactly the implementation of the project. Because we may, maybe, uh, I, I don't want you to answer uh, fully to, the, to this question, but just if you can briefly uh, tell us a few words on this fact that you are actively involved, you are creating community, you're not just analyzing it. I, I don't hear you at the moment. Now it seems it works. No, not yet. Sorry. I think it's important yeah. to... Yeah. yeah. Oh. Switch it off again. Uh, my microphone seems oh, to be... There. How about now? No. Um, okay. uh, creating community is, is the key word. Uh, not from nothing, but from building relationships. And I think that's the step that usually is skipped. Um, it has a lot to do with listening and listening intensely to many, many different people with their stories, with their interests, and finding places where interests overlap. So I don't consider community organizing or whether you can call it community building. I think community building is not enough. It's got to go beyond that toward action. But you've got to start with building relationships, in my opinion. And you do that uh, by developing uh, relationships between very different kinds of people and building trust that allows them to act together in the public arena. And I would also say, just terminologically, we should stop thinking of these things as projects. They're not projects. They are processes that are ongoing and continuous. And all of the habits that I mentioned have to continue throughout all of what is going on. And there's not really, in my opinion, one simple beginning and one simple end point, which I know is demanded of us from people who give money, demanded of us often from um, other parts of the, of the community. Uh, these are processes that, uh, that can be made long-term and can be at least semi-institutionalized in practices like the practice of a of a community organization <clears throat> that has a lifespan, not in months, 
and not even in, in, uh, in several years, but what I'm familiar with over the course of 20, 30, and 40 years of an identity, certainly a changing one of organizing and reorganizing, but uh, the, the one I helped start in Brooklyn 40 years ago still exists. Different people, different mix of institutions, but nonetheless with a, a, an identity and continuity over time. And I think that's a, a, key, um, uh, a key factor and with many changing issues over time, clearly. So it's not just about one uh, issue at a time. I think I failed to probably say that clearly enough in my presentation. Thank you, Thank you very much uh, so far, uh, Leo. Uh, Leo Peter, now we have uh, our last, uh, uh, but not definitely least, presenter. Uh, Jen Shreddy, are you, are you, I think you're, you're in. And, um, and uh, Jen is a um, professor, assistant professor at the Observatoire Sociologique du Changement at Sciences Po in, uh, Science po in Paris. And she, she's focusing uh, uh, her research agenda mostly on digital democracy. Uh, let's now listen to the way she connects her research agenda to the notion of, uh, of community. Okay, the, the PowerPoint uh, is already in. And we, we get the floor is yours, Jen. Thank you. Thank you so much. And it's been such a pleasure listening to all of these talks from very different points of view and also such a wonderful opportunity to uh, speak at an institution um, that really touches me at my core in terms of its interdisciplinary nature and as someone who uh, majored in public policy studies, even the coursework is very uh, similar to what I did uh, at Duke University many, many years ago. Um, so, but because I'm the last speaker, I know that everyone's tired and I'm American, so I'm going to ask everyone to stretch a little bit. I know it's hard to sit for a while. Um, so if you have been to an American baseball game, there's actually a tradition where uh, it's called the seventh inning stretch, right? Seventh of nine innings. So um, kind of get resituated, grab some more caffeine. Um, so yeah, so when I was uh, um, in college, it was actually great to hear uh, Leo Penta's uh, talk about his work with the Industrial Areas Foundation because I was lucky enough to have a professor who uh, was an organizer with them. Uh, and also uh, a professor, so I learned a lot about community organizing. Um, but what I want to talk today about is online communities and what that actually means in reality versus some of the utopian or dystopian ideas about uh, online communities. And a lot of what I'm going to talk about is based on my book uh, that just came out called The Revolution That Wasn't, How Digital Activism Favors Conservatives. It's just out by Harvard University Press um, and is in process of being translated into French, not yet Italian. Um, but what I wanted to do, uh, since I know this time is a big time for transitions in general, uh, for college students, uh, but also in the time of COVID, to talk a little bit about my background. And again, to talk about um, what uh, Leo Penta discussed so well, really outlining um, a lot of really important ways to think about organizing communities. and. Uh, a common book that uh, some people critique, but I think is interesting, if anyone is interested in picking it up, uh, is Saul Linsky's book that's still very relevant. Uh, Leo, you probably know when it was written, maybe the 50s, right? Rules for Radicals. Um, and that really inspired a lot of the work that I did uh, the decade or so after I graduated from college. I uh, began to do as well a lot of community and labor organizing in the United States South, right? Black Belt South, mostly African American rural communities um, based on workplace challenges around health and safety. 
uh, as well as other uh, social injustices. And I learned a lot from the organizers there. Um, and I just decided to put up this, um, the cover of the book because uh, Saul Linsky, you know, one of the things that I learned uh, from this book and other organizers uh, is that you need to start where people are at, right? You have to start what their issues are and concerns are. Um, and that was a lesson for, for me, a white college educated woman doing organizing in this area. And I decided to put also a picture of this button. I don't know if anyone still wears those buttons right now. We maybe change our profile picture on uh, social media. And we used to wear buttons to show our support uh, for a political issue. Um, and this uh, button was uh, based on a struggle uh, that uh, happened quite frequently where uh, this was a case where uh, when black and white workers at a factory would try to organize in the South and the factory owners would try to divide them based on race, would often call in the Ku Klux Klan to try to say that black people were taking over. Um, and there was a whole campaign around this. And at about that time, um, I also decided to uh, see what I could contribute to the movement, not only with organizing, but also with communication. Right, so buttons are a form of communication, t-shirts, that was the other thing we had a lot of. Um, but also uh, at the time, um, VHS and other uh, somewhat higher um, quality, but not much uh, video, right? So these are just, I just dug those these out this morning, um, old videos that uh, I made. I made a number of documentaries about the particular struggle that I mentioned. Um, uh, where workers were trying to organize and overcome not only workplace challenges well, with wage and other issues, but also racism on the job. Um, I was working with these organizations, Black Workers for Justice, other community and labor groups that really saw video as a potential tool to get their story out. Right, they wanted, uh, so we would make uh, videos, a friend and I would make uh, videos using big old cameras um, and we would edit a video, put it together and then tour with it to other local churches, communities, um, not only around the South, but uh, in other areas of the country. Um, and the videos made their way around the world, but it was still very, still limited. It was very mediated. Um, but then I decided to start um, doing, a, I, I wanted to expand outside the South of the US, which was very interesting for me, but I wanted to see what were the connections more globally about what people were facing. Um, and I'm happy to talk in the Q&A more about uh, this experience, but I made a documentary about uh, rural um, Filipino farmers who were facing eviction from their ancestral land because a golf and tourist resort was going to be built. Um, and five farmers were non, were, who were non-violently pro protesting were killed in the process. So the New People's Army um, uh, started to threaten the golf course developers. And this is just a picture of me and my filmmaker interviewing one of the leaders of the New People's Army. Um, and also I, uh, in some ways as a filmmaker, got kind of lucky because Tiger Woods came to the Philippines to promote golf in the country. Uh, so I ended up sneaking into the golf tournament and interviewing him and his dad, um, which, you know, if we think about now uh, what goes viral online, it's something that's very alluring, right? So Kanye West's announcement this week that he was going to run for president, right? Um, you know, using fame and fortune. And we know that uh, celebrities are often, if I open up Twitter, it's often a celebrity that's trending on Twitter, right? Um, but the other thing that I wanted to point out about this um, 
talking about my experience is to really discuss what is not only possible for you, but also to really uh, connect with what change, what tools we have and recognizing that they are tools, right? So I have a picture of this very old camera, but at that time it was so exciting. So no longer did I have to shoot on analog video. This was the first Sony digital video camera, right? It was 1999. It was hard to even get enough tapes to take with us. And they were great because there were these tiny little tapes. Before, if you were going to make, we, you know, we, I was taking a step up. If you wanted to make a film, you had to take these gigantic, um, film canisters, right? And if you wanted to hike around, you know, this, you know, a camera this big was, was small at the time. Um, so a lot of digital technology was really changing the production of online content. Um, but what started to change afterwards, and as I began to tour with my film, um, not only community centers, but also art house theaters, film festivals, but college campuses, I really, I realized that that's what I really love doing, talking to students, not only about the technical aspects of filmmaking, but what communication means in terms of building community, in terms of community organizing, in terms of overcoming social injustices uh, with um, not only organizing, but what kind of tools do we need? Do we still need white college educated women to mediate these this, this communication? And I happened, let me just kind of fast forward a little bit. I happened to go back to school um, in 2006. I decided to go back to grad school to study these issues. So I went to the Harvard Kennedy School for a um, master's degree. I wasn't sure if I wanted to do a PhD. That was a good way to kind of put my foot in the water. But it was a really interesting time. So this is the cover of Time magazine in 2006. And, uh, it, you know, every year, uh, Time has the person of the year. And in 2006, it was you. You for posting videos to YouTube, which had just gone international. Facebook became available to the general public for the first time in 2006. Twitter was launched in 2006. So there was this general idea that anyone could um, post their story online. So no longer did we need this clunky, the idea was no longer did we need this clunky tools or other people to mediate our information. And this is what I wanted to investigate um, a little bit, but I wanna talk about, I put this other um, set of slides up because I uh, first wanted to ask if anyone, I think you can somehow raise your hand, if anyone recognizes these images. I don't know if I'll be able to see anyone. <sighs> Ah, okay, one person. Anybody else? Yay, we have a winner. Anybody else? Okay, so I'm realizing I'm using, this will be my second sports reference, American sports reference. I had not planned on that, but uh, this was from a Super Bowl commercial, American football Super Bowl commercial um, uh, decades ago, and you'll see when it was. Um, and it starts out by this fearless leader, everyone sitting, you know, very drab. You can tell people are sitting and watching uh, the screen and uh, listening to whatever leader is telling them. And in comes this woman dressed uh, in this awesome 1980s era um, uh, exercise gear uh, with a giant sledgehammer. And she swings the sledgehammer around and she smashes that screen and with the leader and says, up, up comes, you know, this, uh, this text on January 24th, Apple computer will introduce Macintosh. And you'll see why 1984 won't be like 1984, right? So just to kind of rewind a little bit, right? So this was a really interesting era, right? So what we had is, it was still the Cold War, Right, um, and of course, um, uh, the book, the 1984 references to, I'm sure many of you are nodding, to uh, George Orwell, a uh, book with the same name, uh, critiquing these uh, authoritarian bureaucratic governments, often a nod to um, what was happening uh, in uh, the Soviet Union. And so there was this very strong reference to technology and ideology. Right? No longer will we have the hierarchies, 
right, that Daniel Bell talked about. No longer will we have this authoritarianism. Um, and in fact, five years later, right, we had the, the, this very real uh, manifestations of the Berlin Wall coming down, people literally smashing that, pulling statues. I should have added one more recently from the Black Lives Matter protests in the US, right? This idea of, of physically bringing down these symbols of authoritarianism and what was supposed to come and rise from the ashes. So if we think of the exact same time that this was happening politically, um, this is a cover of Wired magazine, um, which is kind of the digital technology, Silicon Valley magazine, culture, political, you know, um, tech company, magazine of record, um, so to speak. Uh, and uh, out of the ashes of, of, you know, all these statues and Berlin Wall, everything coming down was supposed to be this phoenix rising, right? Technology was supposed to overcome this. And so the cover of that magazine says, I'm sure most of you can read it, uh, we have it in our power to begin the world over again, quoting um, Thomas Paine from the American um, revolution, right? So this very idea of rebuilding communities uh, with networked individuals using technology, right? And so I showed you the cover of Time Magazine for the person of the year 2006, just five years later, um, the cover of the magazine uh, was the protester of the year, right? So inside the magazine, um, you have a lot of stories about terms like Facebook and Twitter revolutions, right? So this is in reference to not only a few years into the so-called Arab Spring, the indignados in Spain, uh, Occupy Wall Street in the United States. Um, so what everyone was talking about were, was how these tools were really important uh, and critical and, and almost um, uh, essential for uh, these movements. Um, but by this time, I had been back in grad school. I started uh, my PhD at UC Berkeley, and I really wanted to study who these people are, right? Who is this person on the 2006 Time Magazine cover? Who is creating online content? So, um, and who is involved in these online communities? And I did a lot of quantitative analysis where I looked at uh, and found quite stark uh, social class inequalities in particular, right? So even if you look at the people who are online, the digital divide uh, in the production realm um, is still very strong. Um, and there are some other interesting findings around race and gender that I'm happy to talk about in the Q&A. Um, but then I wanted to look at who, who is part of these so-called Twitter and Facebook revolutions, right? So I looked at content production, and then I wanted to tackle um, activism, right? What kind of inequalities, differences, how are people using these tools? Is this smashing of hierarchy happening online? Um, because a lot of these movements um, that uh, were referenced uh, with the use of technology were movements that were very explicitly horizontal, right? So you had this rise of utopianism around the internet. Uh, really, the height of it was 2011, 2012, and then a big crash and burn where you had in the media, people began to start talking about more dystopian uses of internet communities with uh, fake news, bots. Uh, it was really kind of Trump's election or Brexit. We can probably f find a lot of things from 2016 that kind of put a dagger in the heart of this digital utopian idea. Um, and so, uh, but, but despite that, despite right now, right, we're constantly hearing about fake news and disinformation, especially critical now if we think about COVID, um, but there's still this idea that digital technology, whoops, my all, I just lost complete control over my, <laughs> over my screen. Let's see if I can get it back. Uh, let's see, okay. Uh, it'll be okay if I can, but it would be nice. Oh no. Okay, let's see. Um, so let's see. I don't want to spend too much time messing with this, but this is a very good lesson, right? In terms of digital inequality and the tools, and we rely on them way too much. Um, all right, so it's letting me just go back there. That's okay. Um, that's fine. So 
most, as I said, most of the attention was really focused on these big international movements, right? Uh, as I mentioned, Indignados, um, Occupy Wall Street, a lot of American scholars were looking at that. And certainly people uh, have studied the Five Star Movement in Italy, which again, it, it took a different course. It was later, it had, has a lot of differences. But um, what I wanted to do was something different. So in um the social sciences uh, and even more broadly in science we have uh this critique of research that selects on the dependent variable right what does that mean it means uh only you know making in, in this case it means people were making arguments and saying oh my god the internet is transforming collective action it's completely changed it but only looking at movements that had high levels of digital engagement that were very visible, um, that had uh, elite users. At the time, it was mostly looking at movements on the left, politically, um, and increasingly focused on following hashtags, right? Which I do, and I love doing it. It's fun. Um, it's so easy and fast compared to when I started doing this research. Um, but uh, the problem is that if we just chase hashtags, we're not necessarily getting a bigger picture of what's happening. So I took a different approach. I decided rather than to focus on a protest or an event to focus on a political issue. And I wanted to go more meso national movement or rather than super hyper local, I chose a statewide political issue in the US that would attract people from different ideologies, different social classes, and also different hierarchical structures. And so I uh, scraped a lot of online data, um, as well as talked to a lot of people. Um, and I found that around the issue, which is the issue around whether or not public employees, so sanitation workers, teachers, um university professors at public universities whether or not they have the right to a union contract um, and can bargain collectively now this may seem you know very different from especially in europe um, but in the united states uh, labor laws are very very weak um, and this had become a very contentious issue whether or not public workers could have a, a, a trade union contract um, and so I uh, not only analyzed quantitatively a lot of online data, I also, also spent a lot of time uh, doing ethnography, spending time with um, activists, going to meetings, protests, events, um, looking at all their uh, online engagement as well, both from a quantitative and a qualitative perspective to get a, wanted to get a bigger picture of what was happening um, online. And so what we jump to here is the um, just uh, very basic uh, bar chart um, looking at differences based on um, a digital activism score that I developed because I wanted to go beyond Facebook or Twitter, although I did look at those uh, platforms which were the most popular at the time uh, of the study because I wanted to go beyond a platform that might disappear, right? Um, you know, platforms come and go. Uh, so I wanted to look more broadly at a digital activism score. So what I found was that rather than this image on Time Magazine or in general of a digital activist being left-leaning horizontal um, uh, activists, that I found that groups on the right, in this case, uh, dominated much more, uh, more reformist, rather than radical groups. Um, groups that were more hierarchical had higher, more levels of hierarchy in their organization, had much higher levels of digital engagement, those who had more staff members. Um, and if I had included full-time volunteers, the gap would even be higher in terms of volunteers focused on digital engagement. The most stark finding was not a surprise to me as a digital divide scholar, but I think is essential if we think about um, what online communities are and what they're not is that the social class gap was the largest by far. Um, pardon? Oh, um, 
So uh, what I found uh, was that there was this strong digital activism gap. And the three factors that I found uh, shaped this gap uh, were uh, ideology, institutions, and inequality. So I'm gonna very briefly talk about those factors. Um, first was this question of inequality. So I found that uh, organizations themselves, more poor and working class organizations just had fewer resources, fewer tools, fewer staff members to engage with this, uh, fewer, um, uh, less time. Organizers were super busy and didn't always feel like they had the time uh, to even remember how to update uh, whatever platform uh, they may be using, if at all, right? Um, and what I found uh, really surprised me, even as a digital divide scholar, which was out of this issue that I studied of, of about this 65,000 tweets or so that I analyzed around this issue of uh, from all these different groups, these 34 different groups, only one was from a poor and working class organization. One group had formed, a, uh, you know, had created, um, uh, you know, a platform on Twitter and had tweeted once and that was it. And statistically, that's zero, really, if we think about it. Um, and so if we think about whose voices are online that we're listening to and whose voices are not online, this gap is really critical. And what I found was that wasn't just organizations, but individuals themselves, right, had fewer what I call assets. So access, A, S, skills, E, empowerment, and T, time, asset. Spelled a little wrong here. Um, so uh, that was really key. And I put this picture up because it really represents one uh, person, uh, activist I interviewed, who, who really um, said in a very precise way what a lot of people had mentioned. And when I asked her about a number of social media platforms, she raised her hand up and said, I don't get up there. Right? So she was, you know, as a stratification scholar too, she was like physically demonstrating those types of inequalities, right? That was up there. That's what other people do. It's so fast. Um, and if we think about how different platforms change and emerge, um, that eventually some people can quote unquote catch up, but there's always something new. There's always new software. There's always updates, um, uh, things break down, et cetera. So it's hard to keep up. Um, and that's something, uh, the inequality piece is really key. The other issue uh, is institutions. So I showed you that graph where groups with more uh, hierarchical levels and more bureaucracy had much higher levels of digital engagement. So I put two pictures up here that represented groups that had more hierarchy. One was a conservative think tank um, that uh, had a very clear chain of command about how they were going to get their information out. They had, I, I wanna point out, one thing that I, I didn't earlier, I wasn't just studying who is online and how much they're posting, right? Because any of us, I could sit here and live tweet this entire session this morning and tweet out a thousand tweets, but you know, I have what, I don't know, a couple thousand, you know, 4,000, I, I don't know, followers on Twitter. I don't have a huge platform, right? So the other thing that I measured is participation. Right. So I measured how much people were actually participating online. Right. Um, with each uh, with each group. And that is also uh, really important to think about. And so this group, Civitas, uh, had a very clear chain of command. They had one person dedicated to social media. They really understood how it worked. So they had a division of labor and they had a specialization of labor. And so they knew uh, what meme type of memes worked, uh, what types of photos and how important those were. And as Facebook or any me social media platform is constantly changing their algorithm of what, um, you know, will show up on your feed, because we all know that we don't see everything posted by everyone that we're following. But to really understand how that works, you really needed people dedicated to understanding that. The other picture I have here is from the uh, North Carolina Teachers Union, right? Um, so they also had, were very hierarchical. They were very grassroots in many ways. Um, I could have put a Tea Party group in here as well, 
Um, they tended to be somewhat hierarchical, um, had different levels of um, engagement. But what I found uh, was that the more uh, intentionally horizontal groups had much lower levels of digital engagement um, because they did not see the internet as a key way to uh, to really organize and they didn't have a really clear division of labor. Um, and that over time, I'm not just talking about one spike of a protest movement uh, where you don't necessarily need uh, an organization with a lot of uh, bureaucracy, um, but that over time, uh, it's important to really think about uh, these differences. And I think that's a nice place that Daniel Bell's and my work come. So the last finding, so I talked about inequality, institutions being key, ideology, right? Which is of the three factors, the one that may shift the most, right? Um, I draw in the book on an Italian uh, philosopher and activist, Antonio Gramsci, quite a bit when I talk about um, how I observed in my data how ideology operated, how it worked. It wasn't just ideas, but it was also that linkage with institutions, with practices, um, with their, and again, I was focused on digital engagement. So what I found in this case was that uh, of the conservatives that I uh, analyzed and interviewed, again, this ranged from grassroots Tea Party groups to groups even farther to the right, preppers who are preparing for some kind of government um, collapse, which is why you, you may see them a lot in the American news right now, um, uh, of wide variety of groups. They were all focused on questions of freedom, right? free markets, freedom from government, and certainly groups on the left have ideas about freedom, um, but the focus on the groups on the left were much more likely to be around fairness, right? And so when groups on the right were focused on freedom, for them, information was freedom. They, they critiqued the mainstream media of uh, mischaracterizing them, not covering them enough, and for them, their eyes would light up when they would talk about how the internet enabled them to post online information. And for them, it was almost this one way tool of we're gonna just pump out a lot of information. Um, and they were very excited about. I, I analyzed the data. They were much more likely to post articles than groups on the left and also- Sarah, just, yes. just, just to tell you that you have five minutes left. Okay, perfect. I'm, I'm almost done, perfect timing. Thank you. Um, so for them, um, the internet was a really great tool, uh, and they were very excited about it. Again, I'm brush, I mean, you know, broad strokes here in this short talk, but, you know, so their online communities, uh, were very critical to them, but they were also doing a lot of offline organizing groups on the left who tended to be, again, tended to be more focused on fairness really wanted to make sure that a lot of people were engaged and participated in um, their group's activities, right? And so for them, um, the internet was not always the best tool to uh, make sure that everyone was involved, especially groups that were focused on, um, you know, making sure that poor and working class people were involved. The internet for people with a digital divide or didn't have as much access, the internet was not always the best tool uh, in that regard. And so what I found was that um, just as an example of looking at uh, analyzing the photos, so much more often groups on the left, uh, the photos that they would post on social media were people like, you know, uh, all after a meeting or an event, they would stand together, maybe put their arm up, and that's what was often posted online, where groups on the right um, would often post viral memes, which are much more likely uh, to be spread, right? If I post a picture of me and some friends uh, and other activists at a protest, um, or at, an, at, at a meeting, maybe myself and my friends and maybe my mom would retweet that or repost that, um, but no, not a lot of other people, right? So there are a lot of ways um, 
that we see these differences. So I'm just going to close um, with another reference um, that I highly recommend, which is, and I'm sure some of you uh, recognize this, uh, from Monty Python. I could actually do a whole talk on my research with Monty Python images and clips. Um, but this is from the movie, the, you know, the Holy Grail, right? The search for the Holy Grail. So right now with the focus on fake news and uh, misinformation. There's this idea that if we just fix it enough, if we just get rid of Mark Zuckerberg, if we just regulate the heck out of Facebook, then we can have this more utopian community um, online space uh, that people envision. But the reality is that what happens offline is often so much more critical to what happens online. Uh, and what I found overall in my book is that people with more power, um, whether that's resources, uh, institutional power, uh, tended to dominate online. And in order for that to be reversed, it's essential uh, that people uh, build power offline to improve and increase their power online. So that's it. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Jen, for this, uh, for this presentation that has uh, highlighted even more keywords uh, um, so it is. Can you now stop the sharing of yes. your of your um, PowerPoint? Thank you. Uh, so I was trying to to listen to this uh, uh, this panel as it was held by one single speaker to see if it was possible to to uh, to get uh, uh, let's say uh, a cloud of keywords. And of course, uh, we've started with hierarchy. Uh, what Daniel told us, and immediately with Marco, we switched to individuality, which is one of the, the tensions, let's say, the relation between the community and the individual. After all, um, uh, Marco's presentation, Marco Falcone's presentation, insisted very much on this uh, um, a necessity to go down to precision medicine through the relevance of the individual. And if you remember the first question, by Tamoi Fuji was exactly on the, the risk of finding a, an excessive tension between the collective dimension and the community and the risk of what? Suffocating the individuality of, of the, the single individual. Okay. And then uh, Leo Penta moved us towards action. Uh, uh, the, 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 the key habits are all relating to how do we deal with this, let's say, necessity of of uh, having having communities and, and eventually Jen uh, insisted very much on the one of the, the key words that was underlying all the presentation which is power the, the, the need to the, the way we articulate our protest uh, how it is related to this idea of having a community which is self-defining itself fighting for its own uh, aims and goals uh, through uh, using power online, offline, when it is so it is really a brilliant and extremely, extremely complex picture. Um, now I would like to immediately leave the floor to um, Ali Mahboub, who is the first one who booked for, for a question. Uh, please can you can you Ali turn on your your um, and then I will keep note of yes. further questions the way I see them. Okay, please let's start with um, Ali Makbu. Um, hello, everybody. Um, I'm Ali from GG1, and my question is to Professor da uh, Professor um, Daniel Bell, uh, who gave a presentation. Thank you very much for your presentation, first of all. And um, we were listening to the different types of communities. And you talked about the community of strangers, right? In which we talk about, we came across this idea of um, political meritocracy. And in this idea is basically the, you know, the how that are superior in virtue and superior in, uh, in ability needs to be the idea. So there's the, the idea of meritocracy. But what I want to know is um, in this system, in this environment, how do the people on the top, because you also talked about 
the pluralistic view of this. How do the people at the top work or make sure that people at the bottom are also served so that eventually we find the balance? How do we keep that? Because in the good governance or a society that is based on equality or a progressive society is the one in which the people at the bottom are constantly being worked on. And how do we achieve that in a system that according at least what I've understood prioritizes or arranges the society in, in a hierarchy where the best are at the top and the people who are not that capable are at the bottom. How do we involve that or include that in the system that it becomes a cycle rather than a hierarchy? Thank you very much. Um, thank you. It's, it's a great question and, and very difficult to uh, answer. Um, but if there's a multiple level hierarchy, um, it, it, so it's not just the idea that like at the top, the people decide everything, right? I mean, in the case of China, you have this multiple level political system. Uh, here's the ideal, and in, of course, there's always a huge gap between the ideal and the practice. Um, but at the local level, you have, you have public officials who operate in a much more democratic way, including elections in villages, including mechanisms for consultation and participation. Um, and then as you move up further up the hierarchy, there's more of an emphasis on good performance um, and let's say above average ability and virtue. So in the middle level, though, people don't exactly know what works where and when. So there's a lot of experimentation. Um, and, and, and if something operates, I mean, China is like Europe. Think of it as a huge continent, right? If something works in one setting, it might not work in another thing. So let's have a little bit of experimentation, see what works. And those who have performed well in different settings, at the local level and at the experimental level in different settings, ideally, again, there's always a big gap between the ideal and the practice they would be promoted and move up to the top. And at the top, there's no, again, it's, it's a big gap between the ideal and the practice, but there's still a collective leadership system where different um, public officials operate in different ways um, and in consensual ways. So if there's a system where it's one person at the top who decides everything and it's a perfect, like in Aristotle's view, you know, the ideal political system is just one kind of, one, one, let's just say, a philosopher king who knows everything and, 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 and decides, of course, in practice, that person would not be able to serve. It, this is an impossibility. But if there's a very complex system where different levels work in different ways, um, then it's possible for things to operate in a way that's sensitive to diversity. Another thing that's quite important in the Chinese case is what does it mean to serve the people? It just is, it doesn't just mean to serve the current, like in a democracy, it might mean serve the interests of the voters. But in a Chinese case, or at least in a case that has a more meritocratic system, it also means looking for the long term. And on issues like climate change, it might mean taking decisions that benefit people 30 or 40 years from now. It's very hard to do in a purely democratic system where, where public officials are limited by the interests of voters. But in a system that has an ideal of political meritocracy that motivates it part of the way, then some leaders at the highest levels of government can take decisions that benefit people decades from now. So I, I, it's not a very good answer to your question because it's a huge question and very difficult to answer in an informed way. Um, but I think it's important. And also, I, maybe I relate what I say to one of the other speakers. Um, well. Okay, well, let me just stand here and leave room for others. Thank you. Uh, just one, one more, just if, if right. I can ask Professor the question. Um, if, is that okay? Please, quickly, quickly, uh, Ali, yes, go ahead. Sorry. In your, in your system, in, in this idea of political meritocracy, I was just thinking that as teenagers or as, as students, we spend 20, 25 years of our lives not even knowing what we're supposed to do. We're just discovering ourselves, right? And in this system that promotes the idea of, okay, 
I need to be better. I need to be better at what I do. That's the idea of my promotion. The better I will be, the better job I will get, the better, as far as that, my understanding concerns. And a person who doesn't know what they're doing, how would they survive in a system like that? Okay, before, before you answer that, I, I'm asking Dirk Shuk to get ready. Turn on your, your mic because you will be the next one, okay? Please, you, Daniel, go ahead. It, it's, it's a lovely way of putting it, but there's, there's an assumption that um, we know what we're doing as we grow older. I think that's not quite true. I mean, I, I think, um, again, it's a very confusion point that we always live with an awareness that we have very limited perspectives. And part of the point of improvement, it's a never ending quest for improvement, is that, is that we, want, we, we always want to improve. Um, so that, that's, that's something that's true about teenagers. It's something that's true or, for people in their 50s. So long as you maintain this quest for self-improvement, I think, um, then uh, it's possible to be, well, put on, on the road for this meritocratic system. You know, but I don't think what you say, I mean, I'm not even sure, again, is we don't know, do you, do you really, I mean, maybe I want to put this question back to you. You're highly uncertain, but but you still have some basic kind of intuitions about what's right and what's wrong, and you hope to improve, right? Yes. Yes. Thank you. Okay, uh, Derek, you can you can go on. Please introduce briefly yourself, and refer if you, if your question is for some a specific uh, presenter or if you want to address the whole panel. And go ahead. Yeah, hello. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. I hope you can all uh, see me and hear me. I'm uh, Dirk Schuck um, uh, from the Centre Marc Bloch in Berlin. And I, it's, it's good to be back at uh, Tor Vergata. I'm really happy. And, um, and I appreciate, uh, yeah, I cannot say how much I appreciate your uh, holistic approach to the global governance. So, um, but yeah, I, I, have, uh, I have a question uh, for, for Mr. Daniel Bell, uh, more like two questions that are connected. And these uh, uh, go not so much into the sociological topics that Ali opened up with this very, with this great, great, great approach of his, but um, um, more into political theory and political philosophy. So, um, and it's especially about this notion of just hierarchy. And Mr. Bell, you started saying that uh, uh, what is so different about China is that there is a certain approach to hierarchy um, that is kind of taken for granted. And uh, then you mentioned the French Revolution as like kind of a bad example where you could see how the questioning of hierarchy went too far and led into some kind of terror or something. So, I mean, I, uh, I would uh, say that um, still the French Revolution has had a great, in, uh, great progressive impact uh, on European culture in the long term. And if you think at the newer work of someone like uh, Jonathan Eastway, you can see like these divisions within, for example, the French Revolution, the authoritarian populace and the more enlightened rational faction that actually wanted to wanted to build a democratic culture of like uh, rationally being able to criticizing social hierarchy, right? And I think this had the stronger, longer impact on the European culture. But so this is my question. My first question for you is, uh, must there not also be a, a rational way to criticize the social hierarchy, um, especially when it's just taken for granted on an everyday level uh, uh, mustn't there be like a specific culture of critique like it developed in the West actually for social progression to be able to take place? Yeah, how can, how can social progression, uh, 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 this is then my question, in, 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 in political Confucianism uh, that you promote actually take place? And I really have to say also that I admire your work and I find it most interesting and a very, very valid contribution at this point of hate and tension between the East and the West. And the other, um, the other question is, uh, you, you talked a lot and I, I, I really, uh, uh, I think that's a very valuable view of the traditionalist ancient view that uh, people grow wiser with age and how to combine it with our culture. And, um, and 
They are just definitely questioned. Um, but as, as, for example, someone like Montesquieu in the Western tradition, I think, pointed out very nicely, isn't there the problem that this is something that is very difficult to combine with the commercial culture, for example, and especially with a market organized social division of labor, where like, um, like the newer innovative capabilities will always uh, have like the higher value in a certain sense. And, um, and isn't this, like a, isn't this like an inherent problem of like, I would call it a capitalist commercial culture that China also embraced in the last years massively. And that, that uh, uh, yeah, that is, uh, that there's like a systemic contradiction. How would you think that um, the Chinese or the political Confucian system deals with this better than the West, which is dealing horribly with it? But yeah, uh, that, was, that was my two questions. <laughs> Great questions, I'm sorry. Um, I, I, I don't have uh, very good answers um, about, the, I totally agree with you that if you want to progress, you need to have some mechanism for criticism of the status quo. And in the Confucian tradition, in the case of families, I mean, this is something that's not very well known. Even young children are supposed to criticize their parents if they do something morally wrong. It's in the Confucian classics. You know, the classic of Philip Piety more than 2,000 years ago, very explicit. If your parent does something morally wrong, what do you do? But then it's very specific ways of criticizing. Um, you have to find the, the parent in the right mood. If the parent is not in a good mood, then you just, ref just hold on a little bit, you know? And then once you find the parent in the right mood, criticize. If that doesn't work, then you cry and you work on the parent's emotions. And then if that doesn't work, well, then you have to take it, you know? And this part that we wouldn't accept now, even if the parents hit you, then you still take it. We, of course, we reject that now. But the point is that even in the Confucian tradition, there's this view that even young children have, have, a, have an obligation to criticize. And in the political system, Confucians, they owe their obligation to the Tao, to this moral way, not to the status quo. That was institutionalized throughout most of Confucian, you know, imperial China, where public officials selected in this merit correct system had an obligation to criticize. Now, of course, there's not enough of that. I totally agree with you. Um, uh, the second question is huge. I, I, actually, to be frank, is I don't have a. I never thought of it. Um, but let me just say, off the top of my head, um, the the idea, of course, in, in it's in the family that that elderly people are supposed to have more authority. Of course, in society as well. Does that conflict with the idea that we need innovation to have, uh, let's say, economic progress? Again, this is just an intuitive response, but one thing that's in China, things change so fast. Like for example, now when we there's hardly any cash in in society, we pay everything using the uh, WeChat. Um, the thing that's interesting is that elderly people do the same. They react so quickly to new changes. Whereas I'm from Canada. I mean, my mother. I love my mother, but she hasn't progressed like technologically since 1971. Never uses computers. You know, not to mention the internet. I don't know why that is, but in China, sometimes even the elderly seem to be more receptive to technological innovation. I have no, I have no idea why that is. It's just something that I, that I observe. Well, that, that, that's a very interesting point, after all. Okay. Uh, before I leave the floor to Cornelius Palle, I, I have a, um, a question I would like to put to, to Marco Falcone. It is about uh, about the the economic costs of of a full transition to precision medicine the way you envisaged it. So is it, is it really possible to think of uh, that uh, type of medicine implemented generally as a systematic method? And of course, and then a similar question could be uh, for Jen about the social, the social costs of uh, organizing communities online and the tension between online and offline. Of course, it is a topic that you have discussed, but more theoretically, oh, what is the cost, the social cost of moving uh, towards a, 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 a virtual or digitalized or an online dimension of community? Of course, the title of your book already gives us an answer, of course, but if you want to to develop a bit more uh, on this topic. Uh, Marco, it's your turn now. Yeah. 
a really, really important question because um, in the, for example, in uh, countries... Uh, could, could you, loud, could you uh, make Italy, your mic your, a bit louder? We can't really hear much, please. Okay, you hear me now? Now it's better. Okay, better. And uh, the problem is that in countries, for example, Italy, where there is a, a, um, a government and the healthcare, uh, and the healthcare space system is public, there is a great attention to the costs of, for example, first economic costs of such new techniques. And then uh, uh, the, there is a, a debate on what to invest in new technology that allow better diagnosis, but also increase the cost. And there are some models that, uh, um, pharmacoeconomic models that have been uh, published in the last years that demonstrate that if you invest in technology for diagnosis, for example, you have a, a reduction in cost, in, in the overall cost, you spend a lot for the technique, but you waste, um, you reduce the cost, the overall cost, because you reduce the number of uh, uh, not uh, necessary drugs, of the number of not necessary days of hospitalization, and then there is a, a net benefit to invest in some new techniques. And then we will have to implement this uh, uh, behavior at this, uh, this fact in the administrators. As from the point of uh, social consequences, this is a more difficult problem to understand because, for example, the healthcare system in some countries, for example, Italy, has also a social impact because the people are um, identify the state, for example, with the social assistance and with the healthcare assistance. And then when you will be able to diagnose patients with an illness by telemedicine and the patient remain at home, when you will be able to identify the cause of an illness without the patient come to the hospital and with a, a, a very fast technique, probably the relationship between medical doctor and the patient and also the relationship between the people and the government that is represented by the healthcare system will, will, will be different and you may have some social consequences. Then, as uh, during the past centuries, all advancement as a cost and a, a, an advantage. And nowadays we are not, uh, I think that we are not sure on the, will be the consequences of the development of new techniques in the clinical practice. Jenny, if you want to, to briefly answer the point or elaborate, there's one other question, it was, elaborate more, let's say, abstractly on this point. Thank you. Yeah, so there's a couple ways of thinking about what are the costs of moving uh, collective action online. So one point that I think is really important to remember is that if you look historically in the study of social movements, um, certainly communication tools have always been a part of any form of collective action, right? Whether the printing press during the American Revolution and even the French Revolution um, to, you know, people have even talked about, uh, you know, fax machines being essential to uh, the overthrow of what ended up happening in the Soviet Union. Um, or radio during the French resistance, right? So uh, we've always used some type of communication tool. So I just want to put that out first. And I think it's important to see that historically, there have also, there's also been this question of who is able to control these communication tools is also really important. At the same time, when people organize and have enough uh, collective power, even if people are marginalized, if they come together and organize collectively, they can have and kind of take back some of these uh, communication tools or use them in creative ways. Um, but what a lot, what some uh, uh, digital activism scholars have said is if we just look at this specific cost, 
uh, to organizing is that they said, well, actually in the digital era, what we know about uh, collective action more broadly, theories of collective action, right? If we look at Olson and the free rider dilemma, right? Uh, which has been kind of misinterpreted over time, but, but generally how it's interpreted, again, it wasn't exactly Olson's formulation when he wrote it in the 60s, was that, you know, the free to rider dilemma, of course, those of you, I'm sure a lot of students here who studied economics in school, uh, right, uh, is what happens, um, you know, why should I go and participate? Why should I take my time that's valuable, maybe pay for childcare, maybe pay for public transportation to show up to a protest, for example, if I know that other people uh, are going to do it and I can free ride off of them? Um, so there's this cost to organizing and a lot of social movement scholars have said that uh, social movements, and again, this is more broadly, have been more successful when they have more resources. It's a theory called resource mobilization theory. So what digital activism scholars have said, have said, look, like this whole idea of the need for resources and even Olson uh, himself is completely thrown out in the digital era because the costs for participating are so low, so the argument goes, uh, that anyone can participate now, right? We don't, we don't need to be in the same physical space, right? And so we may think that, especially now with COVID and uh, movements trying to figure out um, how to organize online even more so uh, given uh, the pandemic. Um, but the reality is that there've always been these costs, even with digital uh, organizing, right? So I talk a lot about that in my book that, um, you know, those of us who have multiple gadgets, right? So I'm sitting here, I have a backup laptop just in case this one doesn't work. You know, my phone's over there, I have an iPad, right? So many of us have a lot of gadgets, but those are costs that have already been absorbed, right? There's still the cost of time. There's still so many costs involved uh, in engaging online that that is one of the risks. And another way to think about cost, that is the cost <laughs> of uh, moving completely online is that then we end up missing people who don't have that, those tools, who don't have that engagement. And uh, just to kind of uh, piggyback on something that Daniel Bell talked about in terms of the generation divide with digital technology, um, I mean, first off, absolutely. I, you know, young folks are always teaching me in my classes new tools that uh, are being used, and it's really fun to kind of keep up with that and try to analyze things in new and different ways. At the same time, what I found in my research was that it was elderly Tea Party activists who had the time and who went to trainings um, and they ended up dominating online because they had, uh, they tended to have more resources, they tended to have more time, a lot of them were skilled, not everyone, right? You had uh, definitely outliers, um, but I think we have to rethink this whole age question around technology, um, but at the end of the day, the cost of moving online is that we end up uh, leaving some people out and those who have more resources and more power end up dominating online. So we need to think about both the online and the offline going together. Okay, thank you very much. Before I leave the floor to Cornelius, uh, Leo Penta uh, asked to, to, to comment on this issue. And I remind, I, I remind all the speakers that they can enter, that they can intervene anytime, uh, not only when they are asked a specific question. So Leo, please uh, turn on your, your mic and, and go ahead. Thank, thank you very much. Yeah, I just want to push this question a little further, um, Jen particularly in terms of the COVID situation. And um, in, I think that, you know, one of the things that I've been seeing in the work that I do both here and uh, uh, virtually, if you will, in the United States is that uh, we've been looking more at hybrid forms. And um, the difficulty with hybrid forms at this time that I'm, that I'm seeing more and more is that you can generally work with relationships you already have in some other fashion, but generating new relationships and reaching additional people and groups is, is a much greater challenge uh, to do virtually. And that is a function, um, I think, 
resources obviously play a role, but I think it's about the just the dynamic of um, of virtual reality, if you will, at least at the moment. That uh, that first of all, even with something like Zoom or where we have video, it's not quite the same, and it's of course much less when you simply have text. And uh, so just just want to throw that into the mix here, particularly in, in the situation where it doesn't look like we'll be able to have the same kinds of contacts we've been used to having with real people in real situations where they are uh, as, as a key tool to developing uh, the possibility of collective action and power, particularly among people who don't share the same resources who are uh, disadvantaged in that sense. Yeah, I mean, I think um, just to point out, I think you totally hit it on the head that the internet is great for mobilizing, right? Getting people out quickly, um, but not so much for organizing, right? And it's also great at, for what, uh, you know, conservatives tended to super focus on what I call informationalizing, getting information out, right? Mobilizing, and I, you know, so impressed by, a lot of my friends, you know, high school kids who, you know, over the last month in the U.S. got, you know, these, these students just in, the, in a day were able to, you know, these amazing Black Lives Matter protests. Um, and they mobilized so quickly, mostly over Instagram and other tools. And it's amazing. And they were built on existing networks for sure in terms of social networks, but they were able to get people out. The harder project is long-term organizing and really keeping people engaged. And that's where um, resources and structure really make a difference. One, one just um, uh, article that I'd suggest people read, it's a great classic piece, talk about my book uh, by Joe Freeman. She was a sociologist who wrote a lot about uh, the feminist movements. And um, she has this great um, article called The Tyranny of Structurelessness. So this also gets to, um, you know, to these broader structure uh, questions that Daniel Bell was, was speaking about as well. You know, this idea that again, the internet, you know, people say we don't even need organizations anymore. We just have the internet um, and anyone can participate. But what she argues, and again, this was written pre-internet, is that that's what a lot of feminists were saying with understandable frustration that men were dominating a lot of civil rights and other organizing in the 1960s. And so a lot of women's groups said, look, we don't want that higher structure. We want everyone to participate and to speak up. But the problem is that if there's no, uh, you know, uh, specific structure outlined, whatever it is, even if it is more horizontal, um, structure develops regardless and pre-existing inequalities and power differences will still happen. And this idea of structurelessness without an incredibly conscious amount of work and organizing is simply not possible. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, uh, Cornelius, it's your round now, please introduce yourself, turn on the mic and go ahead with your question. Though we have, we still have a four or five questions and we're running a bit out of time. I, I suggest all the students of, uh, of global governance who still want to put questions to the book, uh, their question. And, um, and since we're talking also about gender differences, so far we have only uh, men and uh, in, Boys uh, booking for questions, so I warmly, I warmly invite uh, ladies to to put their questions also. Um, Cornelius, we can't hear you. No, I'm sorry. Try now. Uh, well, try, try again. Hello. Yeah, now. Okay. Okay. I'm sorry for this. Um, Thank you very much for, um, for the panel. Uh, my name is Cornelius Balle and I'm from Germany in the second year of global governance at the moment. And um, yes, I would like to express a huge thank you to all the speakers taking the time to be here with us. Um, it was an amazing panel, very inspiring. Thank you for your contributions. And um, my question came up during uh, Professor Dr. Penta's speech and the idea of the collective we in the me world. And um, to give you a little background on this, uh, why this question, which has been bothering me for a long time, um, in, a, in a voluntary service that I did in East Timor a few years ago, 
I strongly experienced um, this idea of community and I also was lucky to get to know uh, some uh, asset-based community development with uh, Professor Dr. Mary Nelson, um, who was very active and uh, works a lot in Chicago. And um, so in this workshop, I realized how intensely in, let's say, less developed countries, communities work together because they have the need to work together. Whereas then, res um, and the public sector is very weak. Whereas returning to Germany and to Europe, I realized this need for community is like almost gone and it's sort of an alienation, which we can call here the me world and um, everyone focusing more on the individual idea. Um, because what I think is very important in building communities is um, first of all, giving people uh, agency in their local environment, um, which also creates an identity for them and um, also giving them the, the feeling of having a purpose. So being able to have a purpose in your local environment. And um, I feel like in, in Western or modern democracies, this is not really the case anymore. Um, although we've seen some very interesting examples now due to the COVID crisis, where communities also in, in these democracies or here in Europe came together again and had to work together. Um, um, so this idea of the collective we, um, which is very important for humans, I think it's a natural need, um, made me think about the, creating this identity. How do we avoid um, in the collective we, how do we avoid fracturizing among communities and avoid creating an us versus them or create um, by creating an, a collective us versus a collective them? Because that's what we see a lot of in, in uh, nationalism and creating this identity and pride and patriotism in one's own community. And um, yeah, what, like what is the, how can we create small, small communities that allow uh, agency um, also in bigger political structures um, in this especially globalizing world where everything goes global, but we, um, we really have the need at the moment to go local again and to to um, find our identity there. So I believe this can be answered by many professors, uh, by many yeah, of the guests. Thank you, Cornelius. It was really a, a central, central question yours. I think that uh, maybe, I don't know, Leo Penta could be the, the first start and all the others when they can get in whenever they want. No, again, we, we can't. Try again. Yeah, now. Yeah, uh, thank you for the question uh, and turn guten tag. You know, the, uh, this question has been pulled up. I'll just do the COVID example because, uh, you know, as I, as I walk through the streets of Berlin um, and see a lot of people not wearing masks and see how casual some people have become about protecting others, I'm almost tempted to wear a sign around my neck. Uh, you know, I protect you with my mask. Will you protect me with yours? Uh, the, the question of mutuality uh, I think is, 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 a, is a central question to this, to this I and we uh, issue. And of course you can't have a we unless you have I, but I think we've in many cases have gone to the extreme. A bit louder, Leo, please. No, no, we can't hear you now. Uh, obviously you can't have a, an, a we without having uh, an I, but I think we've, tended toward the other extreme and that uh you know even in the in the most liberal of liberal paradigms where uh the only thing you need to look at is whether my act my individual activity is somehow hurting someone else even that has gotten very strained uh in part i think because of uh some of the idea of tradition that, that daniel bell has brought up um and uh the, the necessity to have uh, to have some context in which we do this, but when we don't, and I think that's the case in in uh, Central Europe uh, and in many places in the United States or in the United States generally, more and more, uh, where these things are no longer there, uh, not for necessarily bad reasons, simply because of change and because of uh, diversity. They have to be built. And I think that's the, the core idea 
of developing relationships that then can lead to agency together. But unless those rela relationships are built in intentionally and with a lot of work, I think you don't get to the kind of we, even in societies that are that have a, a strong central government, where perhaps the gap is not that uh, the government is not doing something, but is maybe uh, doing too much, I'd even dare to say, or not answering the questions that uh, others uh, who are uh, part of the community think are the questions that ought to be addressed. So I think uh, those are some of the issues that are involved here. And uh, we could go on for a long time, but I'll, I'll stop with that. Thank you. Okay. Anybody else from, from the panel, Jen, Daniel, Marco, if you want to, to add anything, we, are, we still have m many more questions. So um, I'm inviting you if you want to, to reply to, to be concise, please. Otherwise, we can go on to, to the next. Uh, it's Simon Murbawa. Simon, you there? Hello, yes. can you hear me? Yes, well, uh, yes, perfectly. Thank you. Thank you, Simon. All right. Um, my name is Simon. I'm from the third year of global governance. And first, let me start also by saying thank you very much for this interesting panel. Uh, there were a lot of uh, interesting topics coming up. And I was also wondering about the previous point mentioned by Cornelius about this us versus them because obviously until today it maintains very prominent that communities are still built on this problem that you created based on the difference to another group to another community and i was wondering what would you believe can be the the uh, relations the rules uh, navigating these the system between communities so such as Professor Bell mentioned a system of hierarchies that can work within a community. Do you think something like this could be established between different communities? And if so, um, what about the general problem with the hierarchy that there will always be somebody at the very bottom of the hierarchy? Um, and yeah, basically how can we avoid this problem and how can we um, guide these relations between different communities? Thank you. Sir. If you want to answer, Daniel, turn on the microphone, please. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I think it, it's it's a good question, but it depends on on the social relation and on the kind of community it is. I mean, I don't think there's a there's a general answer. Um, if, for example, if I identify with my family, there's a distinction between my family and other families. Um, but it's not necessarily a problem so long as I don't have a hostile relation to other families. But there's always, there might be a hierarchy, for example, I love my mother more than my neighbor's mother, but I don't necessarily, it's not necessarily a problem. If it's a relation between political communities, um, and there's, you know, again, there's nothing wrong with a person ident identifying and taking pride more with their own political community than with other communities. But it's a problem if it leads to um, irrational hostility or acts of war. So um, there's no general answer, honestly speaking. It really depends on the type of relation and, and form of community that we're talking about. The, the idea that there's a us versus them uh, di difference is not a problem per se. I mean, it only, it only, it's the only problem if it leads to morally undesirable consequences, right? All right. But probably the panelists have more informed uh, responses. I just want to say um, to emphasize that um, it often is vital that people who identify in a certain way do organize together under that umbrella because you know it's the reason why it's important that in the United States, for example, there are African-American organizations because, you know, or women's groups, because if you get a group of people together who tends to dominate the conversation, we're kind of seeing it here, it tends to be, you know, again, I'm talking from an American perspective in particular, but it tends to be white men, right? And so, 
it's important that if people come together where they feel like they have a safe space, not that groups necessarily always have to stay separated, but the whole idea of, you know, we need to separate to unite, right? We need to uh, have a safe space to talk about what our interests and needs, our concerns are, and then we can go to that bigger group uh, and have uh, a discussion that way. So I think that, um, you know, that's really key for uh, community building. Okay, thank you. It is now the turn of Arman Mulic. Arman, are you there? Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, please. Okay, hello, um, everybody. Um, thank you so much, first of all, for brilliant presentations and very, very thought-provoking um, questions that we've had. Um, my question is kind introduce of... Introduce yourself, please, Arman. Just introduce briefly yourself. Oh, of course, of course. My name is Arman and I'm, I'm the first chair of Global Governance. Um, and I would also like to, to kind of push this question of, of Ali, my colleague Ali, from the, about the hierarchy as well. Um, but I would like to push it a bit into the online sphere as well, so to continue the conversation. And the question is um, mainly uh, about the inequalities, as, as in the Professor Schrader already mentioned, um, how we sometimes we see that some people are left out so that we can't hear, hear all of the voices because of the dominating ones. And my question would be, again, again, to push it a bit further, how do we more practically, let's say, direct um, the you know, desired uh, activism on the, on, in the online world? Um, and also, how do we make sure that we cl like close this gap between the voices that we hear all the time and the people who are at the bottom, let's say, of the hierarchy that we that we cannot hear. Is it the policy makers or is there a way to change some of the rules of the social media or do we need to, to start restructuring the social media um, to kind of work towards the goal? Um, thank you so much and I, I hope I was clear. And I think you, all, you should be the first to answer the question. Yeah, uh, those are excellent questions and I think that's really what we're facing now in an even more vital way, um, just to kind of take things back one moment. So in my, I'm actually in the middle of writing this more theoretical article right now on uh, digital inequality and so reflecting back on some of these theories and there's a lot of scholars have said, well, the digital divide in terms of access used to matter, but now that doesn't matter as, as much anymore. We need to think about these other inequalities and think more broadly. Um, and I mean, I even conceptualize of digital production inequality, right? So there's so many ways, but I think what we're facing now with COVID in particular is that uh, basic access is really key when uh, you have, I mean, think about any of you and some of you may be facing this at home. I don't know about your personal situations. If you had to do your schoolwork uh, or your research, you know, sharing one computer with five people, right? Or writing your paper on a mobile phone because you only usually have a library to go and use the internet um, to work, which is true for a lot of people. And so on the one hand, it's like, how do you solve this? Well, there are material needs for sure, but it's more than that because one of the things that I found was this piece in terms of empowerment is really key. Um, so, I mean, I think it's multifold. I mean, yes, we need resources. We need more, you know, high-speed internet access. We need kind of distribution of resources. But at the same time, you know, and skill building, et cetera. But your question about do we transform the platforms? And absolutely with, you know, I mean, yeah, I talked about Instagram. I mean, it's owned by Facebook, right? WhatsApp, it's owned by Facebook, right? So we have this increasing ownership by Silicon Valley, and certainly that matters. But even if all 200, and, 200 of us, I'm seeing 200 participants, if we all got together and spent the next year developing our own social media platform, we would, we would, I think we'd do a better job, <laughs> but we would still have these inequality issues. And so I think in order to resolve things online, we need to have a more broader structural change. Um, but at the same time, all those other steps are key as well. But even in a very practical way of 
Um, what I found, the social movements that I'm speaking specifically around collective action and political organizing, those that were the most successful in terms of getting a wider variety of people understood those differences and knew the best organizers had a long list of people. Okay, this group, I need to contact them by email. This group, I need to give them a phone call. This group, I need to go over to their house, right? It, but it takes work, right? So the work, the title of my book was going to initially, you know, the work of digital democracy, because it does take work and, and democracy more broadly takes work. And I think we need to really, really recognize this and not think that the internet is just simply going to make things easier. Um, most of the organizers that I talked to would often say that things used to be simpler, but now it's it's more complex. In some ways, yes, I can send an email to all 200 of you if I have um, your email addresses, and that's faster than mailing something, you know, before, but everything has sped up. Okay, thank you very much. We have two left questions, uh, unless the, the, the speakers want to to, to talk, maybe Leo, did you, did you turn on the computer? You wanted to add something, but we cannot hear again. Yeah, I know. I just want to triple underline that of point course. about work. Underline, underline, underline work and work that is more complex because of, as, as, as Jen mentioned, the different platforms uh, on, on, on which people communicate. And uh, some people just, you know, you can send them an email all you want, but they read their emails every other week. Uh, and they're not really reachable that way. So I just want to underline the point about the work, the complexity of the work, and in, in a sense, how the work is becoming much and much more hybrid in its forms. And that needs to be, a, I think, a factor in the, in the training and development of people who do this work. Thank you, thank you for this point. Extremely important, I suppose. Uh, Julia Zolotareva, it's your turn now, please. And don't forget to introduce yourself. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. My name is uh, Yulia. I am a GG3 student. Uh, thank you very much uh, to all of the speakers. It was extremely interesting to hear your presentations. And my question is directed both to um, Daniel Bell as well as to Jen Schrady. Uh, so when you mentioned about the fact that um, Kanye West was um, applying for the presidency next year, I was thinking about um, the presentation that we heard before by Daniel Bell and about the meritocratic principles, which he mentioned. And so the question which arose in my mind was, do you think that meritocratic principles such as, for example, the examinations in order to move um, up the uh, career ladder in political field can be applicable in other countries and in other constant contexts? And uh, in this case, uh, do you think that uh, in other contexts, uh, these principles could undermine or strengthen democracy? And also, what are the conditions that should be uh, available in the country in order for the meritocratic principles to uh, work for the betterment of the go governance? Thank you. Maybe Daniel first. Oh, wow, a great question. And again, it requires, I'm, I'm not sure I have a good response, um, but if a, country lacks a long tradition of political meritocracy to be frank it's it's hard i mean any political system has to build on a mainstream political culture to be stable and to consolidate itself so i think there are limits to which the chinese political experience can translate to others that said let me just mention i i had one student from italy her name was El, El, elena ziliotti um, when I gave a course in Singapore on political meritocracy, and she had a very simple idea for improving the meritocratic system in Italy, but also uh, also improving it would it would not only would it not conflict with democracy, but it would also improve democracy. And she said, "Why can't we just have political parties set a simple multiple choice question, no harder than a driving examination, and, and then?" And then the voter would have to pass multiple, simple multiple choice exam from two parties so that they're aware of diversity. And, and then they would have the right to vote. And it's a very simple idea. I think it's a good idea. Um, and it would, it, would, it, would, it would eliminate the voters have no knowledge at all about the issues. Um, and, it, and I think it would, it would allow for some sort of meritocratic element 
in a democratic system that, that would improve the political system. But whether or not it's realistic, I'm not sure. But uh, I guess my point is that there are some proposals, but it have to be pretty, not the whole you know, Chinese political experience, but aspects of it might be relevant elsewhere. One historical point, you know, why in the, in the Western political system, the civil service is more meritocratic. We have examinations to select civil servants, whether it's Canada or the UK or the US. And that was a direct influence of the examination system in China. So I'm not, there is a historical precedent for elements of meritocracy uh, allowing for improvement in democratic systems. Whether it will happen in the future, I'm not sure. I think that maybe Jen, you want to add anything, or Leo, anybody? Where, where is, I... No, again, Leo, sorry. That's a work now. Where is the meritocracy amongst our politicians? What, what exam do they have to take? I mean, my political experience has often been that uh, some of the least qualified people are the people that end up uh, with the positions of power. And I'll just make it a bit provocative in that sense. Okay. Um, Luke, do you want to add, add anything, Daniel, or it's okay? Um, well, very briefly, uh, Sun Yat-sen, who was regarded as the founding father in both mainland China and Taiwan, he proposed that political leaders have to go through two processes. One is you have to be elected, and two, you have to pass a basic examination before you assume power. It's never been implemented here, but it's not such a terrible idea. <laughs> okay, okay la last question by Luca Gambelli. Luca, turn on the mic if you're not on, and yes. then introduce yourself, and please, with the last question. Okay, uh, good, uh, good morning, everybody. And I would like, first of all, to thank you, the old panel for the incredible speeches. I'm Luca from the second year of Global Governance. And I would like to ask uh, the old panel something about what I think is one of the main pillars of any community, which is trust. And I see, tr just uh, for a brief introduction, I see trust as the real clue of any community, exactly, it boosts social cohesion. And of course, it's a function of the, uh, all the very important elements that have been discussed as well during the discussion. And, but I believe we could all agree that at least in the present world, we are facing quite a deep lack of trust within society. If we think about trust in politics and politicians, trust in markets, trust in foreigner or the unknown, or even simply trust on the other next to us, or the opinion of the experts, as we can also see with the current pandemic, for example. To make it very short, what I'm trying to ask uh, here, is it really possible to scale up from the small local community to the world community and still feel embedded in a deep, meaningful social fabric without losing that fundamental element uh, of trust among each other? Or maybe to use anthropological terms, is it possible to create a real virtual global village? Or are we confined, let's say, to only such a strong attachment to our own local and concrete roots so that no community can exist that's the one that we can uh, see and touch or at least project in our mind well, thank you well, I'm, I'm really thank you uh, i want to thank a look at advance because for this question and also i thank the the, the 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 speakers because i'm not one of them so i'm not supposed to answer this terribly <laughs> the, the extremely difficult question the floor is yours please whoever has the was brave enough to try to give an answer to Luca's question, please. How do we yeah, deal with that? We trust, we trust in you. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, no, no, it, no it, it is really, it is one of the central elements of any, any social organization, uh, be it a community, be it a nation. Uh, of course, even a, we know how economists, need trust in order to, to do their work. So it is really, I'm really happy that we can finish with this question. I don't know if you have any suggested answers, but uh, I think that this is a, the perfect question to, to wrap up many, many things that we have touched in this, in this morning that has been extremely, extremely uh, intense and so stimulating. Uh, uh, I don't want to give you the responsibility to, to force you to an answer, but I see that Leo has turned on the computer, so I trust him for for 
or saying some, some, some words. Okay? Just, just some words, um, brief words. I mean, uh, maybe if I had the, the complete answer to the scale up question, we'd have the formula for world peace. <laughs> no, sorry. Turn on, turn on. You, when, whenever you're on, I, I get cut off. So, uh, but obviously, and, and thank you for the question, because I think you, you know, you, Luca, you put your finger on a central issue uh, that to say that trust is um, easy to lose, but hard to regain once it's lost. And I think that's one of the issues that we're struggling with at the moment. And as I say, I really don't know an answer to the larger question, but I think in the smaller scale, and that's where things, in my opinion, have to begin, that's where we need to do a lot of this relational work to go from being a community of strangers, if you will, to at least being a community of fellow travelers who trust each other uh, to help them guide each other along the way. Maybe if I could stay with that metaphor. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I now leave the floor to Gustavo Piga for the final remarks. Thank you, Piero, for wonderfully coordinating a, a wonderful panel itself. The questions were really interesting. Um, I think that there is a, an elephant in the room, and uh, I think, Piero, you know that elephant very well since you've been the translator of that book called On, On Kings. I think that uh, the word power uh, was uh, very present today. I mean, we did not talk about the word power, but it seemed to me that it was very difficult to uh, separate the, our understanding of what community is and how community impact or should impact from the word power itself. So I learned really a lot. I think uh, it was uh, exactly what we needed. Um, we have achieved uh, our, a greater understanding of the word itself as we wanted from an interdisciplinary perspective, which is what I want, what we wanted. So Marco Falcone, Daniel Bell, Leo Penta, Jen Shradi, and Piero Vereni, obviously. There's going to be, even if you are not hearing it, a huge round of applause from the 218 people that have been together with you today. And we can give it a try, Gustavo. Huh? We can give it a try. We can, we can we ask all the very many times. So we have two alternatives. One is to do like Arman is doing right now, which oh. is put on the clapping thing, or that they just uh, put the mic on, put the mic <laughs> on, and they just uh, say what uh, is in their mind uh, uh, by saying thank you or, or whatever they want. But I know that they have thoroughly enjoyed and now, I, I, before I shut up, I just uh, remind everybody that we have one exact hour. So we'll start not at 2, but at 2.10 with the second part. Obviously, our uh, speakers are invited to stay if they want. We know that they have other engagements, but if they want, they can stay. And we will have the second part of the, our uh, symposium, the one chaired by Luca Pes, uh, related to the activities that the students have uh, prepared. So. Thank you so much again. If whoever wants to take the mic off can do so now and thank our speakers. And see you at 2.10. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. 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 Ciao Giulia, ci vediamo dopo? Grazie. Grazie a lei, dopo.